Well, howdy doody. Um, here's just a super cut of all my Gilgamesh related content. We'll have timestamps to, you know, the content of the text, my analysis of it, and etc. At the end, it's kind of a, a long, more in-depth analysis of the whole story. Uh, we'll have timestamps for all of that. Uh, these were all originally separate videos, so if there's non sequiturs at any point, um, that's why. I went through to try to take them out, but I might have missed some. Anyhow, hope you enjoy. I'm big, I'm big, he's big, he's big, big Mac Grand Rise, Big Mac Grand Rise, Whopper, Whopper, Whopper. What's up, everybody? Say go Vax, as usual here. I know I said I probably wasn't going to have anything new until next year, but as the video title would imply, today we are going to get into the introductory and first tablets of the Epic of Gilgamesh, discuss its implications, compare some translations. By the end, I guarantee all listeners will have gained the powers of levitation and autofellatio. I also got uh, a couple other books. Um, uh, well, three of them by Tacitus. The Histories, Agricola, and Germania. Germania. Uh, all of them really, really good books. Some of my favorites. And I have Nine Years Among the Indians by Herman Lehman coming in the mail, which is also just chef's kiss. Mwah. It's so damn good. It's like... I mean, it's like Blood Meridian, but for real. Um, so yeah, enough about that. Just I uh, wanted to give a preview of the things I might be getting into sooner than I anticipated. And let's jump into Gilgamesh. Kitty, no. Kitty. Alright, so the translation I'm going to be reading from is, uh, it's an old... Penguin Classics paperback, uh, an English version with an introduction by N.K. Sandars, revised edition incorporating new material, this edition being from 1972. So, like the first half of it is, you know, it's all good stuff, history of the epic, discovery of the tablets, historical background, literary background, how the tablets survived. But I'm not going to read that, because me talking about that stuff is going to come at the end of end of Tablets 1 and 2. Or, well, the introductory tablet and Tablet 1, which I will be reading today. So, the Epic of Gilgamesh Prologue. Gilgamesh, King in Uruk. I will proclaim to the world the deeds of Gilgamesh. This was the man to whom all things were known. This was the king who knew the countries of the world. He was wise, he saw mysteries, and knew secret things. He brought us a tale of the days before the deluge. He went on a long journey, was weary, worn out with labor. Returning, he rested. He engraved on a stone the whole story. When the gods created Gilgamesh, they gave him a perfect body. Shamash, the glorious sun, endowed him with beauty. Hadad, the god of the storm, endowed him with courage. The great gods made his beauty perfect, surpassing all others, terrifying like a great wild bull. Two-thirds they made him god, and one-third man. In Uruk he built walls, a great rampart, and the temple of blessed Iana, for the god of the firmament Anu, and for Ishtar, the goddess of love. Look at it still today, the outer wall where the cornice runs. It shines with the brilliance of copper, and the inner wall, it has no equal. Touch the threshold, it is ancient. Approach Iana, the dwelling of Ishtar, our lady of love and war, the like of which no latter-day king, no man alive can equal. Climb upon the wall of Uruk. Walk along it, I say. Regard the foundation terrace and examine the masonry. Is it not burnt brick and good? The seven sages laid the foundations. Tablet 1. The Coming of Enkidu. Gilgamesh went abroad in the world, but he met with none who could withstand his arms till he came to Uruk. But the men of Uruk muttered in their houses, Gilgamesh sounds the toxin for his amusement. His arrogance has no bounds by day or night. No son is left with his father, for Gilgamesh takes them all, even the children. Yet the king should be a shepherd to his people. His lust leaves no virgin to her lover, neither the warrior's daughter nor the wife of the noble. Yet this is the shepherd of the city, wise, comely, and resolute. The gods heard the lament. The gods of heaven cried to the lord of Uruk, to Anu, the god of Uruk. A goddess made him, strong as a savage bull. None can withstand his arms. No son is left with his father, for Gilgamesh takes them all, 
And is this king the shepherd of his people? His lust leaves no virgin to her lover, neither the warrior's daughter nor the wife of the noble. When Anu heard their lamentations, the gods cried to Aruru, the goddess of creation. You made him, O Aruru, now create his equal. Let it be like him as his own reflection, his second self, stormy heart for stormy heart. Let them contend together and leave Uruk in quiet. So the goddess conceived an image in her mind, and it was of the stuff of Anu of the firmament. She dipped her hands in water and pinched off clay. She let it fall in the wilderness, and noble Enkidu was created. There was virtue in him of the god of war, of Ninurtai himself. His body was rough. He had long hair like a woman's. It waved like the hair of Nisaba, the goddess of corn. His body was covered with matted hair like Samuquans, the god of cattle. He was innocent of mankind. He knew nothing of the cultivated land. Enkidu ate grass in the hills with the gazelle and lurked with wild beasts at the water holes. He had joy of the water with the herds of wild game. But there was a trapper who met him one day, face to face at the drinking hole, for the wild game had entered his territory. On three days he met him face to face, and the trapper was frozen with fear. He went back to his house with the game that he had caught, and he was dumb, benumbed with terror. His face was altered like that of one who has made a long journey. With awe in his heart he spoke to his father. Father, there is a man unlike any other, who comes down from the hills. He is the strongest in the world. He is like an immortal from heaven. He ranges over the hills with wild beasts, and eats grass. He ranges through your land, and comes down to the wells. I am afraid, and dare not go near him. He fills in the pits which I dig, and tears up my traps set for the game. He helps the beasts to escape, and now they slip through my fingers. His father opened his mouth, and said to the trapper, My son, in Uruk lives Gilgamesh. No one has ever prevailed against him. He is strong as a star from heaven. Go to Uruk, find Gilgamesh, extol the strength of this wild man. Ask him to give you a harlot, a wanton from the temple of love. Return with her, and let the woman's power overcome this man. When next he comes down to drink at the wells, she will be there, stripped naked, and when he sees her beckoning, he will embrace her, and then the wild beasts will reject him. So the trapper set out on his journey to Uruk, and addressed himself to Gilgamesh, saying, A man unlike any other is roaming now in the pastures. He is as strong as a star from heaven, and I am afraid to approach him. He helps the wild game to escape. He fills in my pits and pulls up my traps. Gilgamesh said, Trapper, go back. Take with you a harlot, a child of pleasure. At the drinking hole, she will strip, and when he sees her beckoning, he will embrace her, and the game of the wilderness will surely reject him. Now the trapper returned, taking the harlot with him. After a three days' journey, they came to the drinking hole, and there they sat down. The harlot and the trapper sat facing one another, and waited for the game to come. For the first day, and for the second day, the two sat waiting. But on the third day, the herds came. They came down to drink, and Enkidu was with them. The small wild creatures of the plains were glad of the water, and Enkidu with them, who ate grass with the gazelle, and was born in the hills. And she saw him, the savage man, come from far off in the hills. The trapper spoke to her, There he is. Now, woman, make your breasts bare. Have no shame, do not delay, but welcome his love. Let him see you naked, let him possess your body. When he comes near, uncover yourself and lie with him. Teach him, the savage man, your woman's art. For when he murmurs love to you, the wild beasts that shared his life in the hills will reject him. She was not ashamed to take him. She made herself naked and welcomed his eagerness. As he lay on her murmuring love, she taught him the woman's art. For six days and seven nights they lay together, for Enkidu had forgotten his home in the hills. But when he was satisfied, he went back to the wild beasts. Then, when the gazelle saw him, they bolted away. When the wild creatures saw him, they fled. Enkidu would have followed, but his body was bound as though with a cord. His knees gave way when he started to run. His swiftness was gone. And now the wild creatures had all fled away. Enkidu was grown weak, for wisdom was in him, and the thoughts of a man were in his heart. So he returned and sat down at the woman's feet and listened intently to what she said. You are wise, Enkidu, and now you have become like a god. Why do you want to run wild with the beasts in the hills? Come with me. I will take you to strong-walled Uruk, to the blessed temple of Ishtar and of Anu, of love and of heaven. There Gilgamesh lives, who is very strong, and like a wild bull, he lords it over men. When she had spoken, Enkidu was pleased. He longed for a comrade, for one who would understand his heart. Come, woman, and take me to that holy temple, to the house of Anu and Ishtar, and to the place where Gilgamesh lords it over the people, 
I will challenge him boldly. I will cry out aloud in Uruk, I am the strongest here. I have come to challenge the old order. I am he who was born in the hills. I am he who is strongest of all. She said, Let us go, and let him see your face. I know very well where Gilgamesh is in great Uruk. O oh, Enkidu, there all the people are dressed in their gorgeous robes every day, and every day is a holiday. The young men and the girls are wonderful to see. How sweet they smell. All the great ones are roused from their beds, O oh, Enkidu. You who love life, I will show you Gilgamesh, a man of many moods. You shall look at him well in his radiant manhood. His body is perfect in strength and maturity. He never rests by night or day. He is stronger than you, so leave your boasting. Shamash the glorious sun has given favors to Gilgamesh, and Anu of the heavens and Enlil and Ea the wise has given him deep understanding. I tell you, even before you have left the wilderness, Gilgamesh will know in his dreams that you are coming. Now Gilgamesh got up to tell his dream to his mother, Ninsun, one of the wise gods. Mother, last night I had a dream. I was full of joy. The young heroes were round me, and I walked through the night under the stars of the firmament, and one, a meteor of the stuff of Anu, fell down from heaven. I tried to lift it, but it proved too heavy. All the people of Uruk came round to see it. The common people jostled, and the nobles thronged to kiss its feet. And to me, its attraction was like the love of a woman. They helped me. I braced my forehead, and I raised it with thongs and brought it to you, and you yourself pronounced it my brother. Then Ninsun, who is well-beloved and wise, said to Gilgamesh, This star of heaven which descended like a meteor from the sky, which you tried to lift but found too heavy, when you tried to move it, it would not budge, and so you brought it to my feet, I made it for you, a goad and spur, and you were drawn as though to a woman. This is the strong comrade, the one who brings help to his friend in need. He is strongest of wild creatures, the stuff of Anu, born in the grasslands, and the wild hills reared him. When you see him, you will be glad. You will love him as a woman, and he will never forsake you. This is the meaning of the dream. Gilgamesh said, Mother, I dreamed a second dream. In the streets of strong-walled Uruk there lay an axe. The shape of it was strange, and the people thronged around. I saw it and was glad. I bent down, deeply drawn towards it. I loved it like a woman, and wore it at my side. Ninsun answered, That axe which you saw, which drew you so powerfully like love of a woman, that is the comrade whom I give you, and he will come in his strength like one of the host of heaven. He is the brave companion who rescues his friend in necessity. Gilgamesh said to his mother, A friend, a counselor, has come to me from Enlil, and now I shall befriend and counsel him. So Gilgamesh told his dreams, and the harlot retold them to Enkidu. And now she said to Enkidu, when I look at you, you have become like a god. Why do you yearn to run wild again with the beasts in the hills? Get up from the ground, the bed of the shepherd. He listened to her words with care. It was good advice that she gave. She divided her clothing in two, and with one half she clothed him, and with the other herself, and holding his hand she led him like a child to the sheep folds, into the shepherd's tents. There all the shepherds crowded around to see him. They put down bread in front of him, but Ankidu could only suck the milk of wild animals. He fumbled and gaped, at a loss what to do or how he should eat the bread or drink the strong wine. Then the woman said, Enkidu, eat bread, it is the staff of life, drink the wine, it is the custom of the land. So he ate till he was full, and drank strong wine, seven goblets. He became merry, his heart exulted, and his face shone. He rubbed down the matted hair of his body and anointed himself with oil. Enkidu had become a man. But when he had put on man's clothing, he appeared like a bridegroom. He took arms to hunt the lion so that the shepherds could rest at night. He caught wolves and lions, and the herdsmen lay down in peace, for Enkidu was their watchman, that strong man who had no rival. He was merry living with the shepherds till one day, lifting his eyes, he saw a man approaching. He said to the harlot, Woman, fetch that man here. Why has he come? I wish to know his name. She went and called the man, saying, Sir, where are you going on this weary journey? The man answered, saying to Enkidu, Gilgamesh has gone into the marriage house and shut out the people. He does strange things in Uruk, the city of great streets. At the roll of the drum, work begins for the men and work for the women. Gilgamesh the king is about to celebrate marriage with the queen of love, and he still demands to be first with the bride, the king to be first and the husband to follow. For that was ordained by the gods from his birth, from the time the umbilical cord was cut. But now the drums roll for the choice of the bride, and the city groans. At these words, Enkidu turned white in the face. 
I will go to the place where Gilgamesh lords it over the people. I will challenge him boldly, and I will cry aloud in Uruk, I have come to cha change the old order, for I am the strongest here. Now Enkidu strode in front, and the woman followed behind. He entered Uruk, that great market, and all the folk thronged around him, where he stood in the street in strong-walled Uruk. The people jostled, speaking of him. They said, He is the spit of Gilgamesh. He is shorter. He is bigger of bone. This is the one who was reared on the milk of wild beasts. His is the greatest strength. The men rejoiced. Now Gilgamesh has met his match. This great one, this hero whose beauty is like a god, he is a match even for Gilgamesh. In Uruk the bridal bed was made, fit for the goddess of love. The bride waited for the bridegroom. But in the night Gilgamesh got up and came to the house. Then Enkidu stepped out. He stood in the street and blocked the way. Mighty Gilgamesh came on, and Enkidu met him at the gate. He put out his foot and prevented Gilgamesh from entering the house. So they grappled, holding each other like bulls. They broke the doorposts and the walls shook. They snorted like bulls locked together. They shattered the doorposts and the walls shook. Gilgamesh bent his knee with his foot planted on the ground, and with a turn, Enkidu was thrown. Then immediately his fury died. When Enkidu was thrown, he said to Gilgamesh, There is not another like you in the world. Ninsun, who is as strong as a wild ox in the byre, she was the mother who bore you, and now you are raised above all men, and Enlil has given you the kingship, for your strength surpasses the strength of men. So Enkidu and Gilgamesh embraced, and their friendship was sealed. End of Tablet 1「Okay, time for thoughts of mine, so let's just jump into it with my analysis. Naturally, first off, this story wasn't written from 2100 to 1800 BC like the Wikipedia article will tell you. It was certainly copied in those times, but I, I think I suggest it was at least a thousand years older than that. Are we expected to believe that these copies we have just happen to be the very first drafts? Like, I'm sure they were telling this story before. So, the introduction immediately establishes the main character and setting in terms of place and more roughly in point of time as somewhere after the flood but before the benighted age of so-called latter-day kings, quote-unquote, this Babylonian version of the story was recorded in. To be fair, that time frame I'm referring to is about 10,000 years long, though it will be narrowed down by information that comes later in Tablet 3. Um, the interesting part to me, though, is just how the transcribers that added this introductory piece see themselves as compared to the originals, so to speak. What was this previous age? It can't be the time before the Deluge, as that was even before Gilgamesh. I posit this is due to a post-Sodom and Gomorrah worldview. Things used to be a lot cooler, but now God doesn't really talk to us anymore. Iana is still excellent. We still say Anu and Ishtar are based. Yet, something feels missing. Um, naturally, this is based based on the assumption that we're reading a translation of the, the 1800 BC Babylonian version, not the earlier, more fragmentary Sumerian version. For more info on this, this idea of mine of, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah incident being somehow hugely consequential to the global status quo between us and the divines, See my video on if Genesis 14 through 19 and Masala Parva are describing the same events. References to the seven sages laying the foundation seems to indicate some ancient syncretism with Hinduism. Isn't that, like, I think that concept is also present in Sanatan Dharma. I also remember seeing some article saying that the oldest example of Sanskrit was found in Syria. Who knows what that means, since the Indian Ocean networks of trade are vaster and older than most in the West realize. And who knows if that claim from the article is even true. And speaking earlier of those Sumerian originals now lost or fragmented or buried in the secret archives of powerful groups like the Vatican or the owners of Hobby Lobby, I have to wonder how they describe the quote-unquote dream Gilgamesh had about the meteor. Like, just the fact that they describe it as having legs is very interesting to me. In any case, I want to read now from The Stairway to Heaven by Zechariah Sitchin. He has a passage dedicated to that passage from Gilgamesh about the meteor and 
I have no idea where he's getting this from. <laughs> it's like, uh, you know, I, I'll say repeatedly that I think Sitchin is right about a lot, but I think there's also a lot that just, whoo, I couldn't tell you, man. Um, this is just really interesting to me, though, so let's let's hear him out. Roving by daytime, restless at night, Gilgamesh sought to stay young by intruding on newly wed couples and insisting on having intercourse with the bride ahead of the bridegroom. Then one night he saw a vision, which he felt was an omen. He rushed to his mother to tell her what he saw, so that she might interpret the omen for him. Now he's quoting from the... Uh, something. <laughs> My mother, during the night, having become lusty, I wandered about. In the midst of night, omens appeared. A star grew larger and larger in the sky. The handiwork of Anu descended towards me. No longer quoting here. The handiwork of Anu that descended from the skies fell to earth near him. Gilgamesh continued to relate. I sought to lift it. It was too heavy for me. I sought to shake it. I could neither move nor raise it. No longer quoting. While he was attempting to shake loose the object with, which must have embedded itself deep into the ground, quote, the populace jostled toward it, the nobles thronged about it, end quote. The object's fall to earth was apparently seen by many, for, quote, the whole of Uruk land was gathered about it, end quote. The, quote, heroes, the strong men, then lent Gilgamesh a hand in his efforts to dislodge the object that fell from the sky. Quote, the heroes grabbed the lower part, I pulled it by its forepart, end quote. While the object was not fully described in the texts, it was certainly not a shapeless meteor, but a crafted object worthy of being called the handiwork of the great Anu himself. The ancient reader apparently required no elaboration, having been familiar with the term, quote, handiwork of Anu, end quote, or with its depiction, as possibly one shown on an ancient cylinder seal. Figure 63. Ah, oh, crap, now I'm going to have to take a picture of that to include it. The Gilgamesh text describes the lower part, which was grabbed by the heroes, a term that may be translated as legs. It had, however, other pronounced parts and could even be entered, as becomes clear from the further description by Gilgamesh of the night's events. I pressed strongly its upper part. I could neither remove its covering nor raise its ascender. With a destroying fire its top, I then broke off and moved into its depths. Its movable that which pulls forward, I lifted, and brought it to thee. Gilgamesh was certain that the appearance of the object was an omen from the gods concerning his fate, but his mother, the goddess Ninsun, had to disappoint him. That which descended like a star from heaven, she said, foretells the arrival of, quote, a stout comrade who rescues a friend is come to thee. He is the mightiest in the land. He will never forsake thee. This is the meaning of thy vision, end quote. She knew what she was talking about, for unbeknownst to Gilgamesh, in response to pleas from the people of Uruk that something be done to divert the restless Gilgamesh, the gods arranged for a wild man to come to Uruk and engage Gilgamesh in wrestling matches. He was called Enkidu, a creature of Enki, a kind of Stone Age man who had been living in the wilderness among the animals. So, yeah, gonna, I'm gonna stop reading there. Um, I don't know if this is the exact same text that I just read, or, like, um, what Sitchin is doing here is taking the same text that I just read the, you know, Penguin translation of, taking the Babylonian original of that and translating it differently. Or maybe he's got, you know, like, you know, went to the Berlin Museum of the Old Near East or something in, back in the 70s and had access to some Sumerian stuff I don't know about. I think it's probably the former, but in any case, that passage is really, you know, it's attractive testicles to me. It is, it's pretty nuts. And so, like, you know, just thought I would share what Sitchin had to say. Though I know it's pseudo, he's pseudo sued, sued Wikipedia, and, well, experts confirmed that, you know, he's definitely not right about everything, but, yeah. So that's, that's my first video on the Epic of Gilgamesh. I don't know if I'm going to just keep going through that or if I want to move over to Tacitus or uh, Nine Years Among the Indians. Yeah, I also wrote something that I think might be too edgy for YouTube, but I also might just upload it and see if I get banned because, like, you know, controversy is always fun. Anyways, uh... Yeah, keep keep it 100 my dudes. Just 
Um, yeah, I don't know. I wish I had some. I wish I could figure out how to sign off of these videos. Good night. Hello again so soon, everyone. Um, surprise snow day. Can't get out of where I'm parked. So let's read Tablet 2 of the Epic of Gilgamesh, The Forest Journey. Enlil of the Mountain, the father of the gods, had decreed the destiny of Gilgamesh. So Gilgamesh dreamed, and Enkidu said, The meaning of the dream is this. The father of the gods has given you kingship. Such is your destiny. Everlasting life is not your destiny. Because of this, do not be sad at heart. Do not be grieved or oppressed. He has given you the power to bind or to loose, to be the darkness and the light of mankind. He has given you unexampled supremacy over the people, victory in battle from which no fugitive returns, in forays and assaults from which there is no going back. But do not abuse this power. Deal justly with your servants in the palace. Deal justly before Shamash. The eyes of Enkidu were full of tears, and his heart was sick. He sighed bitterly, and Gilgamesh met his eye, and said, My friend, why do you sigh so bitterly? But Enkidu opened his mouth and said, I am weak. My arms have lost their strength. The cry of sorrow sticks in my throat. I am oppressed by idleness. It was then that the Lord Gilgamesh turned his thoughts to the country of the living. On the land of cedars, the Lord Gilgamesh reflected. He said to his servant Enkidu, I have not established my name stamped on bricks as my destiny decreed. Therefore, I will go to the country where the cedar is felled. I will set up my name in the place where the names of famous men are written. And where no man's name is written yet, I will raise a monument to the gods. Because of the evil that is in the land, we will go to the forest and destroy the evil. For in the forest lives Humbaba, whose name is Hugeness, a ferocious giant. But Enkidu sighed bitterly and said, when I went with the wild beasts ranging through the wilderness, I discovered the forest. Its length is ten thousand leagues in every direction. Enlil has appointed Humbaba to guard it, and armed him with sevenfold terrors. Terrible to all flesh is Humbaba. When he roars, it is like the torrent of the storm. His breath is like fire, and his jaws are death itself. He guards the cedars so well, that when the wild heifer stirs in the forest, though she is sixty leagues distant, he he hears her. What man would willingly walk into that country and explore its depths? I tell you, weakness overpowers whoever goes near it. It is not an equal struggle when one fights with Humbaba. He is a great warrior, a battering ram. Gilgamesh, the watchman of the forest, never sleeps. Gilgamesh replied, Where is the man who can clamor to heaven? Only the gods live forever with glorious Shamash. But as for us men, our days are numbered. Our occupations are a breath of wind. How is this? Already you are afraid. I will go first, although I am your lord, and you may safely call out, Forward, there is nothing to fear. Then if I leave behind me a name that endures, men will say of me, Gilgamesh has fallen in fight with ferocious Humbaba. Long after the child has been born in my house, they will say it and remember. Enkidu spoke again to Gilgamesh, O oh, my lord, if you will enter that country, go first to the hero Shamash. Tell the sun god, for the land is his. The country where the cedar is cut belongs to Shamash. Gilgamesh took up a kid, white without spot, and a brown one with it. He held them against his breast, and he carried them into the presence of the sun. He took in his hand his silver scepter, and he said to glorious Shamash, I am going to that country, O Shamash, I am going. My hands supplicate, so let it be well with my soul, and bring me back to the quay of Uruk. Grant, I beseech your protection, and let the omen be good. Glorious Shamash answered, Gilgamesh, you are strong. But what is the country of the living to you? O oh, Shamash, hear me, hear me, Shamash, let my voice be heard. Here in the city man dies, oppressed at heart, man perishes with despair in his heart. I have looked over the wall, and I see the bodies floating on the river, and that will be my lot also. Indeed I know it is so, for whoever is tallest among men cannot reach the heavens, and the greatest cannot encompass the earth. Therefore I would enter that country, because I have not established my name stamped on brick, as my destiny decreed. I will go to the country where the cedar is cut. I will set up my name where the names of famous men are written, and where no man's name is written I will raise a monument to the gods. The tears ran down his face, and he said, Alas, it is a long journey that I must take to the land of Humbaba. If this enterprise is not to be accomplished, why did you move me, Shamash, with the restless desire to perform it? How can I succeed if you will not succor me? 
If I die in that country, I will die without rancor. But if I return, I will make a glorious offering of gifts and of praise to Shamash. So Shamash accepted the sacrifice of his tears, like the compassionate man he showed him mercy. He appointed strong allies for Gilgamesh, sons of one mother, and stationed them in the mountain caves. The great winds he appointed, the north wind, the whirlwind, the storm and the icy wind, the tempest and the scorching wind, like vipers, like dragons, like a scorching fire, like a serpent that freezes the heart, a destroying flood, and the lightning's fork. Such were they, and Gilgamesh rejoiced. He went to the forage and said, I will give orders to the armorers. They shall cast us our weapons while we watch them. So they gave orders to the armorers, and the craftsmen sat down in conference. They went into the groves of the plain and cut willow and boxwood. They cast them for axes of nine score pounds, and great swords they cast with blades of six score pounds each one, with pommels and hilts of thirty pounds. They cast for Gilgamesh the axe, quote, might of heroes, and the bow of Anshan. And Gilgamesh was armed, and Ankidu, and the weight of the arms they carried was thirty score pounds. The people collected, and the counselors in the streets, and in the marketplace of Uruk, they came through the gate of seven bolts, and Gilgamesh spoke to them in the marketplace. I, Gilgamesh, go to see that creature of whom such things are spoken, the rumor of whose name fills the world. I will conquer him in his cedar wood, and show him the strength of the sons of Uruk. All the world shall know of it. I am committed to this enterprise, to climb the mountain, to cut down the cedar, and to leave behind me an enduring name. The counselors of Uruk, the great market, answered him, Gilgamesh, you are young. Your courage carries you too far. You cannot know what this enterprise means, which you plan. We have heard that Humbaba is not like men who die. His weapons are such that none can stand against them. The forest stretches for ten thousand leagues in every direction. Who would willingly go down to explore its depths? As for Humbaba, when he roars it is like the torrent of the storm, his breath is like fire, and his jaws are death itself. Why do you crave to do this thing, Gilgamesh? It is no equal struggle when one fights with Humbaba, that battering ram. When he heard these words of the counselors, Gilgamesh looked at his friend and laughed. How shall I answer them? Shall I say I am afraid of Humbaba? I will sit at home all the rest of my days? Then Gilgamesh opened his mouth again and said to Enkidu, My friend, let us go to the great palace, to Igalma, and stand before Ninsun, the queen. Ninsun is wise, with deep knowledge. She will give us counsel for the road we must go. They took each other by the hand as they went to Igalma, and they went to Ninsun, the great queen. Gilgamesh approached. He entered the palace and spoke to Ninsun. Ninsun, will you listen to me? I have a long journey to go to the land of Humbaba. I must travel an unknown road and fight a strange battle. From the day I go until I return, till I reach the cedar forest and destroy the evil which Shamash abhors, pray for me to Shamash. Ninsun went into her room. She put on a dress becoming to her body. She put on jewels to make her beautiful. She placed a tiara on her head, and her skirts swept the ground. Then she went up to the altar of the sun, standing upon the roof of the palace. She burnt incense and lifted her arms to Shamash as the smoke ascended. O Shamash! Why did you give this restless heart to Gilgamesh, my son? Why did you give it? You have moved him, and now he sets out on a long journey to the land of Humbaba, to travel an unknown road and fight a strange battle. Therefore, from the day that he goes till the day he returns, until he reaches the cedar forest, until he kills Humbaba, and destroys the evil thing which you, Shamash, abhor, do not forget him. But let the dawn, Aya, your dear bride, remind you always, and when the day is done, give him to the watchman of the night to keep him from harm. Then Ninsun, the mother of Gilgamesh, extinguished the incense, and she called to Enkidu with this exhortation. Strong Enkidu, you are not the child of my body, but I will receive you as my adopted son. You are my other child like the foundlings they bring to the temple. Serve Gilgamesh as a foundling serves the temple, and the priestess who reared him. In the presence of my women, my votaries and hierophants, I declare it. Then she placed the amulet for a pledge round his neck, and she said to him, I entrust my son to you. Bring him back to me safely. And now they brought to them the weapons. They put in their hands the great swords in their golden scabbards, and the bow and the quiver. Gilgamesh took the axe, he slung the quiver from his shoulder, and the bow of Anshan, and buckled the sword to his belt. And so they were armed and ready for the journey. Now all the people came and pressed on them, and said, When will you return to the city? The counselors blessed Gilgamesh, and warned him. 
Do not trust too much in your own strength. Be watchful. Restrain your blows at first. The one who goes in front protects his companion. The good guide who knows the way guards his friend. Let Enkidu lead the way. He knows the road to the forest. He has seen Humbaba and is experienced in battles. Let him press first into the passes. Let him be watchful and look to himself. Let Enkidu protect his friend and guard his companion and bring him safe through the pitfalls of the road. We, the counselors of Eric, entrust our king to you, O Enkidu. Bring him back safely to us. Again to Gilgamesh they said, May Shamash give you your heart's desire. May he, may he let you see with your eyes the thing accomplished which your lips have spoken. May he open a path for you where it is blocked, and a road for your feet to tread. May he open the mountains for your crossing, and may the night time bring you the blessings of night. And Lugal Banda, your guardian god, stand beside you for victory. May you have victory in the battle as though you fought with a child. <laughs> Wash your feet in the river of Humbaba, to which you are journeying. In the evening dig a well, and let there always be pure water in your water skin. Offer cold water to Shamash, and do not forget Lugal Banda. Then Enkidu opened his mouth and said, Forward, there is nothing to fear. Follow me, for I know the place where Humbaba lives, and the paths where he walks. Let the counselors go back. Here is no cause to fear. When the counselors heard this, they sped the hero on his way. Go, Gilgamesh. May your guardian god protect you on the road and bring you safely back to the quay of Uruk. After twenty leagues, they broke their fast. After another thirty leagues, they stopped for the night. Fifty leagues they walked in one day. In three days, they had walked as much as a journey of a month of two weeks, of a month and two weeks. They crossed seven mountains before they came to the gate of the forest. Then Enkidu called out to Gilgamesh, Do not go down into the forest. When I opened the gate, my hand lost its strength. Gilgamesh answered him, Dear friend, do not speak like a coward. Have we got the better of so many dangers and traveled so far to turn back at last? You who are tried in wars and battles, hold close to me now, and you will feel no fear of death. Keep beside me, and your weakness will pass. The trembling will leave your hand. Would my friend rather stay behind? No. We will go down together in the heart of the forest. Let your courage be roused by the battle to come. Forget death and follow me a man resolute in action, but one who is not foolhardy. When two go together, each will protect himself and shield his companion, and if they fall, they leave an enduring name. Together they went down into the forest, and they came to the green mountain. There they stood still. There they were struck dumb. They stood still and gazed at the forest. They saw the height of the cedar. They saw the way into the forest and the track where Humbaba was used to walk. The way was broad and the going was good. They gazed at the mountain of cedars, the dwelling place of the gods, and the throne of Ishtar. The hugeness of the cedar rose in front of the mountain. Its shade was beautiful, full of comfort. Mountain and glade were green with brushwood. There Gilgamesh dug a well before the setting sun. He went up the mountain and poured out fine meal on the ground and said, O mountain, dwelling of the gods, bring me a favorable dream. Then they took each other by the hand and lay down to sleep, and sleep that flows from the night lapped over them. Gilgamesh dreamed, and at midnight sleep left him, and he told his dream to his friend. Enkidu, what was it that woke me if you did not? My friend, I have dreamed a dream. Get up. Look at the mountain precipice. The sleep that the gods sent me is broken. Ah, my friend, what a dream I have had. Terror and confusion, I seized hold of a wild bull in the wilderness. It bellowed and beat up the dust till the whole sky was dark. My arm was seized and my tongue bitten. I fell back on my knee. Then someone refreshed me with water from his water skin. Enkidu said, Dear friend, the god to whom we are traveling is no wild bull, though his form is mysterious. That wild bull which you saw is Shamash the protector. In our moment of peril he will take our hands. The one who gave water from his water skin, that is your own god who cares for your good name, your Lugal Banda. United with him, together we will accomplish a work, the fame of which will never die. Gilgamesh said, I dreamed again. We stood in a deep gorge of the mountain, and beside it we two were like the smallest of swamp flies, and suddenly the mountain fell. It struck me and caught my feet from under me. Then came an intolerable light blazing out, and in it was one whose grace and whose beauty were greater than the beauty of this world. He pulled me out from under the mountain. He gave me water to drink, and my heart was comforted. Then he set my feet on the ground. Then Enkidu, the child of the plains, said, let us go down from the mountain and talk this thing over together, he said to Gilgamesh, the young god. Your dream is good. Your dream is excellent. The mountain which you saw is Humbaba. 
Now surely we will seize and kill him, and throw his body down as the mountain fell on the plain. The next day, after twenty leagues, they broke their fast, and after another thirty, they stopped for the night. They dug a well before the sun had set, and Gilgamesh ascended the mountain. He poured out fine meal on the ground, and said, O mountain dwelling of the gods, send a dream for Ankidu, make him a favorable dream. The mountain fashioned a dream for Ankidu, it came, an ominous dream. A cold shower passed over him, it caused him to cower like the mountain barley under a storm of rain. But Gilgamesh sat with his chin on his knees, till the deep sleep which flows over all mankind lapped over him. Then, at midnight, sleep left him. He got up and said to his friend, Did you call me, or why did I wake? Did you touch me, or why am I terrified? Did not some god pass by? For my limbs are numb with fear. My friend, I saw a third dream, and this dream was altogether frightful. The heavens roared, and the earth roared again. Daylight failed, and darkness fell. Lightning flashed. Flyer blazed out, the clouds lowered. They rained down death. Then the brightness departed. The fire went out, and all was turned to ashes fallen about us. Let us go down from the mountain and talk this over, and consider what we should do. When they had come down from the mountain, Gilgamesh seized the axe in his hand. He felled the cedar. When Humbaba heard the noise far off, he was enraged. He cried out, Who is this that has violated my woods and cut down my cedar? But, but glorious Shamash called to them out of heaven, Go forward, do not be afraid. But now Gilgamesh was overcome by weakness, for sleep had seized him suddenly. A profound sleep held him. He lay on the ground, stretched out speech, speechless, as though in a dream. When Enkidu touched him, he did not rise. When he spoke to him, he did not reply. O Gilgamesh, lord of the plain of Kulab, the world grows dark. The shadows have spread over it. Now it is the glimmer of dusk. Shamash has departed. His bright head is quenched in the bosom of his mother. Ningal. O Gilgamesh, how long will you lie like this asleep? Never let the mother who gave you birth be forced in mourning into the city square. At length Gilgamesh heard him. He put on his breastplate. Quote, the voice of heroes, of thirty shekels weight. He put it on as though it had been a light garment that he carried, but it covered him altogether. He straddled the earth like a bull that snuffs the ground, and his teeth were clenched. By the life of my mother Ninsun, who gave me birth, and the life of my father, Div Divine Lugalbanda, let me live to be the wonder of my mother, as when she nursed me on her lap. A second time he said to him, by the life of Ninsun, my mother who gave me birth, and by the life of my father, divine Lugal Banda, until we have fought this man, if he, if man he is, this god, if god he is, the way I took to the country of the living will not turn back to the city. Then Enkidu, the faithful companion, pleaded, answering him, O oh my lord, you do not know this monster, and that is the reason you are not afraid. I, who know him, I am terrified. His teeth are a dragon's fangs. His countenance is like a lion. His charge is the rushing of the flood. With his looks he crushes alike the trees of the forest and reeds in the swamp. O oh my lord, you may go on if you choose into this land, but I will go back to the city. I will tell the lady, your mother, all your glorious deeds till she shouts for joy, and then I will tell the death that followed till she weeps for bitterness. But Gilgamesh said, Immolation and sacrifice are not yet for me. The boat of the dead shall not go down, nor the three-ply cloth be cut for my shrouding. Not yet will my people be desolate, nor the pyre be lit in my house, and my dwelling burnt on the fire. Today give me your aid, and you shall have mine. What then can go amiss with us too? All living creatures born of the flesh shall sit at last in the boat of the west. And when it sinks, when the boat of Magilum sinks, they are gone. But we shall go forward and fix our eyes on this monster. If your heart is fearful, throw away fear. If there is terror in it, throw away terror. Take your axe in your hand and attack. He who leaves the fight unfinished is not at peace. Humbaba came out from his strong house of cedar. Then Enkidu called out, O Gilgamesh, remember now your boasts in Uruk. Forward, attack, son of Uruk. There is nothing to fear. When he heard these words, his courage rallied. He answered, Make haste. Close in. If the watchman is there, do not let him escape to the woods where he will vanish. He has put on the first of his seven splendors, but not yet the other six. Let us trap him before he is armed. Like a raging wild bull, he snuffed the ground. The watchman of the woods turned full of threatenings. He cried out. Humbaba came from his strong house of cedar. He nodded his head and shook it, menacing Gilgamesh. And on him he fastened his eye, the eye of death. Then Gilgamesh called to Shamash, and his tears were flowing. O glorious Shamash, I have followed the road you commanded. 
But now, if you send no succor, how shall I escape? Glorious Shamash heard his prayer, and he summoned the great wind, the north wind, the whirlwind, the storm and the icy wind, the tempest and the scorching wind. They came like dragons, like a scorching fire, like a serpent that freezes the heart, like a destroying flood and the lightning's fork. The eight winds rose up against Humbaba. They beat against his eyes. He was gripped, unable to go forward or back. Gilgamesh shouted, By the life of Ninsun my mother, and divine Lugal Banda my father, in the country of the living, in this land I have discovered your dwelling. My weak arms and my small weapons I have brought to this land against you, and now I will enter your house. So he felled the first cedar, and they cut the branches and laid them at the foot of the mountain. At the first stroke Humbaba blazed out, but still they advanced. They felled seven cedars, and cut and bound the branches and laid them at the foot of the mountain. And seven times Humbaba loosed his glory on them. As the seventh blaze died out, they reached his lair. He slapped his thigh in scorn. He approached like a noble wild bull roped on the mountain, a warrior whose elbows are bound together. The tears started to his eyes, and he was pale. Gilgamesh, let me speak. I have never known a mother, no, nor a father who reared me. I was born on the mountain. He reared me, and Enlil made me the keeper of this forest. Let me go free, Gilgamesh, and I will be your servant. You shall be my lord. All the trees of the forest that I tended on the mountain shall be yours. I will cut them down and build you a palace. He took him by the hand and led him to his house, so that the heart of Gilgamesh was moved with compassion. He swore by the heavenly life, by the earthly life, by the underworld itself. O oh, Enkidu, should not the snared bird return to its nest, and the captive man return to his mother's arm? Enkidu answered, The strongest of men will fall to fate if he has no judgment. Namtar, the evil fate that knows no distinction between men, will devour him. If the snared bird returns to its nest, if the captive man returns to his mother's arms, then you, my friend, will never return to the city where the mother is waiting who gave you birth. He will bar the mountain road against you and make the pathways impassable. Humbaba said, Enkidu, what you have spoken is evil. You, a hireling, dependent for your bread, in envy and for fear of arrival you have spoken evil words. Enkidu said, Do not listen, Gilgamesh. This Humbaba must die. Kill Humbaba first, and his servants after. But Gilgamesh said, If we touch him, the blaze and the glory of light will be put on, out in confusion. The glory and glamour will vanish. Its rays will be quenched. Enkidu said to Gilgamesh, Not so, my friend. First entrap the bird. And where shall the chicks run then? Afterwards we can search out the glory and the glamour, when the chicks run distracted through the grass. Gilgamesh listened to the words of his companion. He took the axe in his hand, he drew the sword from his belt, and he struck Humbaba with a thrust of the sword to the neck, and Enkidu, his comrade, struck the second blow. At the third blow, Humbaba fell. Then there followed confusion, for this was the guardian of the forest, whom they had felled to the ground. For as far as two leagues, the cedars shivered when Enkidu felled the watcher of the forest. He at whose voice Hermon and Lebanon used to tremble. Now the mountains were moved and all the hills, for the guardian of the forest was killed. They attacked the cedars, the seven splendors of Humbaba were extinguished. So they pressed on into the forest, bearing the sword of eight talents. They uncovered the sacred dwellings of the Anunnaki, while Gilgamesh felled the first of the trees of the forest Enkidu cleared their roots as far as the banks of the Euphrates. They set Humbaba before the gods, before Enlil. They kissed the ground and dropped the shroud and set the head before him. When he saw the head of Humbaba, Enlil raged at them. Why did you do this thing? From henceforth, may the fire be on your faces. May it eat the bread that you eat. May it drink where you drink. Then Enlil took again the blaze and the seven splendors that had been Humbaba's. He gave the first to the river, and he gave to the lion, to the stone of execration, to the mountain, and to the dreaded daughter of the queen of hell. O Gilgamesh, king and con conqueror of the dreadful blaze, Wild bull who plunders the mountain, who crosses the sea, glory to him. And from the brave, the greater glory is Anki's. End of Tablet 2 So, this tablet is interesting to me, in that you can clearly see the effects of the telephone game. But mainly because what they're trying to describe being still so out there that there's not really a way to poeticize it and make it believable for a later audience lacking the context of direct observation and interaction with the gods and their handiwork, 
beyond these transcribers just saying it was all a dream. I used to read Word Up magazine, Salt and Pepper. <clears throat> Anyways, uh, I made an error in my last video by saying that this is the 1800 BC Babylonian version. In reality, it could be from any time between then and 1300 BC. So like a 200 to 700 years since anyone had seen the gods together in formation as they sailed across the sky. So, to the story, in preparation for the journey to the west, it is further evidenced that God's house is not a metaphorical description for their temples in these days, as they go to speak with Shamash and seek his blessing. Distinctly different from the Babylonian transcribers writing in the preface with nostalgia for these times when good temples, unreplicable in their modern times, could be built. What changed? After some cajoling, he does and grants Gilgamesh some whirlwinds, which you may recall from the Inanna, Ereshkigal, and Nurgle dramas, which I also have videos on, and which the connections of this story with those will become more apparent in the next tablet. These whirlwinds, whatever is attempting to be described, seem to be a fairly common self-defense implement among the divines. It could be that wind is not really the right translation, since the same character can mean breath, spirit, command, uh, things like that, such as in components of names like Enlil or Lilitu. Interestingly, Enkidu's long experience of the wilderness and warfare is referenced, having taken him from the hills unspecified, but looking at a map, I'd say probably east or north of Sumeria, all the way to the far west in Lebanon, at the Cedar Mountain, to have seen Humbaba before, and then come back, which seems a little bit at odds with his backstory of being pinched off from clay and dropped into the wild. Too bad nobody wrote a better background story for him yet, because basically the that's what the caveman versus aliens fiction I'm working on is. Anyways, evil is in the land. But since this occurred millennia before the Sodom and Gomorrah incident, for comparison, these are like Ramayana times, while Abraham's story gets more into Mahabharata territory describing the transitional times. So it can't be due to the gods' absence. I assume this strife is related to the drama leading up to the events of Sodom and Gomorrah, Kurukshetra, etc. Contention over Ishtar as chief deity of Earth for fear of what letting the woman drive might do. Marduk being prosecuted for Demuzi's death or him and Nabu subsequently being sneaky-beaky about the land? Difficult to say, but it looks like things were already becoming unsettled even this long before the tragedies that occurred roughly around 2000 BC. The closer they get to, and the more they interact with him, Baba, the more intensely our heroes report a feeling of overpowering unease described as terror or weakness that prevents them from advancing or being effective in combat. This is something not at all uncommon in reports of encountering some cryptids and alien greys, probably because both are examples of Galu demons. Pseudo-living, sexless, pale, purpose-built enforcers, like the ones that would later retrieve Ishtar from the underworld, in that story. As far as I'm aware, Galu, Algol, and Ghul are all etymologically related. Algol, like the star, Ghul, as in Ra's al Ghul, meaning basically the same thing it does in English, Ghul or Ogre, and apparently being linked with cool, an archaic Arabic word meaning an extremely fine powder, like might be used in makeup, like foundation. I also headcanon that the golem of Jewish folklore sounds too much like galu to not be related, so there's that. What does all of this mean? No idea. But I'd like to imagine it is evidence that these things are some kind of biological construct, cells that can be formed into a colony organism. Why they can take so... This would explain why they can take any shape, why so many folkloric monsters across the world have the ability to shapeshift and or become a gas to avoid detection or capture. Perhaps this hive intelligence, once formed, can learn and adapt to its task. However, this opens it up to the risk of something like an AI developing rampancy, a la bungee lore, if not properly maintained. Perhaps leading to something like Humbaba lamenting his station in life and attempting to betray his master to serve Gilgamesh. But, of course, Enkidu, Enkidu references what the, what the Prince of Persia in the Sands of Time would later learn, that never take into your service one who betrayed their master to do so. Continuing to speculate, maybe something like a hyperspatially entangled mitochondria, but that drinks like the fifth dimension, the way that a chloroplast drinks sunlight, 
thus explaining their apparent lack of a need for rest or sustenance. I really, really do not know. I'm literally just daydreaming, but, you know, I do enjoy thinking about this kind of stuff. Um, Gilgamesh also repeated, he repeatedly references establishing a name. Now, I must admit, I was definitely tempted to read Sitchin's thoughts and etymological arguments again in this video, but I think it'd be a lot quicker to say that, much in the case of the character Lil having several meanings in different contexts, I don't know what the name is supposed to be. Maybe it's a rocket ship, as Sitchin posits? The description of the upheaval, rumbling, glare, clouds, and rain of death that Gilgamesh describes all sound like they could be a rocket launch. Humbaba was there guarding something. And this is in the neighborhood of the city of Hailing, Jerusalem. Houston versus Cape Canaveral, perhaps? All I can assert for sure is that these names recorded in the land of the cedars, the land of everlasting life, have some significance beyond their names simply being remembered in song by the layman. It seems distinct from that. A practical reason behind Gilgamesh's otherwise arbitrary association between immortality and climbing up to the sky. What exactly that may be, I can't tell you for sure. But it does seem to be there, and that association is not nothing. I know I've made this point before, but just because it's, you know, God comes from the sky is present in virtually every religious tradition, that doesn't mean it can be taken for granted. That's actually, it's more concerning that everyone thinks that than it would be if it were just some isolated thing. I think. Anyhow, that was Tablet 2 of the Epic of Gilgamesh and my perfectly sane and rational and based in reality thoughts on it. So, um, yeah. Have a good night. This mic is pretty nice, it, the way it dampens out the, the ambient noise. I wish it could do that with my tinnitus. Um, alright. So, Tablet 3, this one's a doozy, so I guess we'll just get into it. Gilgamesh washed out his long locks and cleaned his weapons. He flung back his hair from his shoulders. He threw off his stained clothes and changed them for new. He put on his royal robes and made them fast. When Gilgamesh had put on the crown, glorious Ishtar lifted her eyes, seeing the beauty of Gilgamesh. She said, Come to me, Gilgamesh, and be my bridegroom. Grant me seed of your body, let me be your bride, and you shall be my husband. I will harness for you a chariot of lapis lazuli and gold, with wheels of gold and horns of copper, and you shall have mighty demons of the storm for draft mules. When you enter our house in the fragrance of cedar wood, Threshold and throne will kiss, kiss your feet. Kings, rulers, and princes will bow down before you. They shall bring you tribute from the mountains and the plain. Your ewes shall drop twins and your goats triplets. Your pack ass shall outrun mules. Your oxen shall have no rivals and your chariot horses shall be famous far off for their swiftness. Gilgamesh opened his mouth and answered glorious, glorious Ishtar. If I take your hand in marriage, what gifts can I give in return? What ointments and clothing for your body? I would gladly give you bread and all sorts of food fit for a god. I would give you wine to drink fit for a queen. I would pour out barley to stuff your granary. But as for making you my wife, that I will not. How would it go with me? Your lovers have found you like a brazier which smolders in the cold, a back door which keeps out neither squall of wind nor storm, a castle which crushes the garrison, pitch that blackens the bearer, a water skin that chafes the carrier, a stone which falls from the parapet, a battering ram turned back from the enemy, a sandal that trips the wearer. Which of your lovers did you ever love forever? What shepherd of yours has pleased you for all time? Listen to me while I tell the tale of your lovers. There was Tammuz, the lover of your youth. For him you decreed wailing, year after year. You loved the many-colored roller, but still you struck and broke his wing. Now in the grove he sits and cries, Cappy, Cappy, my wing, my wing. You have loved the lion, tremendous in strength. Seven pits you have dug for him, and seven. You have loved the stallion, magnificent in battle. And for him you decreed whip and spur and a thong, to gallop seven leagues by force and to muddy the water before he drinks. And for his mother, Silili, lamentations. You have loved the shepherd of the flock, he made meal cake for you day after day. He killed kids for your sake. You struck and turned him into a wolf. 
Now his own herd boys chase him away, his own hounds worry his flanks. And did you not love Ishulanu, the gardener of your father's palm grove? He brought you baskets filled with dates, without end, every day he loaded your table. Then you turned your eyes on him and said, Dearest Ishulanu, come here to me, let us enjoy your manhood, come forward and take me, I am yours. Ishulanu answered, What are you asking from me? My mother has baked and I have eaten. Why should I come to such as you for food that is tainted and rotten? For when was a screen of rushes sufficient protection from frosts? But when you had heard his answer, you struck him. He was changed to a blind mole deep in the earth, one whose desire is always beyond his reach. And if you and I should be lovers, should not I be served in the same fashion as all these others whom you loved once? When Ishtar heard this, she fell into a bitter rage. She went up to high heaven, her tears poured down in front of her father Anu, and Antum her mother. She said, My father, Gilgamesh has heaped insults on me. He has told over all my abominable behavior, my foul and hideous acts. Anu opened his mouth and said, Are you a father of gods? Did not you quarrel with Gilgamesh the king? So now he has related your abominable behavior, your foul and hideous acts. Ishtar opened her mouth again, and said again, My father, give me the bull of heaven to destroy Gilgamesh. Fill Gilgamesh, I say, with arrogance to his destruction. But if you refuse to give me the bull of heaven, I will break in the doors of hell and smash the bolts. There will be, there will be confusion of people, those above with those from the lower depths. I shall bring up the dead to eat the living, and the hosts of the dead will outnumber the living. Anu said to great Ishtar, if I do what you desire, there will be seven years of drought throughout Uruk, when corn will be seedless husks. Have you saved grain enough for the people, and grass for the cattle? Ishtar replied, I have saved grains for the people, grass for the cattle, for seven years. Of seedless husks there is grain, and there is grass enough. When Anu heard what Ishtar had said, he gave her the bull of heaven to lead by the halter down to Uruk. When they reached the gates of Uruk, the bull went to the river, with his first snort, cracks opened in the earth, and a hundred young men fell down to their death. With his second snort, cracks opened, and two hundred fell to their death. With the third snort, cracks opened, Ankidu doubled over, but instantly recovered. He dodged aside, and leapt on the bull, and seized it by the horns. The bull of heaven foamed in his face. It brushed him with the thick of its tail. Ankidu cried to Gilgamesh, My friend, we boasted that we would leave enduring names behind us. Now thrust in your sword between the nape and the horns. So Gilgamesh followed the bull. He seized the thick of its tail. He thrust the sword between the nape and the horns and slew the bull. When they had killed the bull of heaven, they cut out its heart and gave it to Shamash, and the brothers rested. But Ishtar rose up and mounted the great wall of Uruk. She sprang on to the tower and, uttering a curse, Woe to Gilgamesh, for he has scorned me in killing the bull of heaven. When Ankidu heard these words, he tore out the bull's right thigh and tossed it in her face, saying, If I could lay my hands on you, it is this I should do to you, and lash the entrails to your side. Then Ishtar called together her people, the dancing and singing girls, the prostitutes of the temple, the courtesans. Over the thigh of the bull of heaven, she set up lamentations. But Gilgamesh called the smiths and the armorers, all of them together. They admired the immensity of the horns. They were plated with lapis lazuli, two fingers thick. They were thirty pounds each in weight, and their capacity in oil was six measures, which he gave to his guardian god, Lugalbanda. But he carried the horns into the palace and hung them on a wall. Then they washed their hands in the Euphrates, they embraced each other and went away. They drove through the streets of Uruk, where the heroes were gathered to see them, and Gilgamesh called to the singing girls, Who is most glorious of the heroes? Who is most eminent among men? Gilgamesh is the most glorious of heroes! Gilgamesh is the most eminent of men! And now there was feasting, and celebrations, and joy in the palace, till the heroes lay down, saying, Now we will rest for the night. When the daylight came, Ankidu got up and cried to Gilgamesh, O oh, my brother, such a dream I had last night. Anu and Lil, Ia, and heavenly Shamash took counsel together, and Anu said to Enlil, Because they have killed the bull of heaven, and because they have killed Humbaba, who guarded the cedar mountain, one of the two must die. Then glorious Shamash answered the hero Enlil, It was by your command they killed the bull of heaven, and killed Humbaba, and must Ankidu die although innocent? 
and Lael flung round in rage at Gloria's Shamash. You dare say this? You who went about with them every day like one of themselves? So Enkidu lay stretched out before Gilgamesh. His tears ran down in streams, and he said to Gilgamesh, O oh, my brother, so dear as you are to me, brother, yet they will take me from you. Again, he said, I must sit down on the threshold of the dead, and never again will I see my dear brother with my eyes. While Enkidu lay alone in his sickness, he cursed the gate as though it was living flesh. You there, wood of the gate, dull and insensible, witless. I searched for you over twenty leagues until I saw the towering cedar. There is no wood like you in our land, seventy-two cubits high and twenty-four wide. The pivot and the ferrule and the jams are perfect. A master craftsman from Nippur has made you. But, oh, if I had known the conclusion, if I had known that this was all the good that would come of it, I would have raised the axe and split you into little pieces, and set up here a gate of wattle instead. Ah, if only some future king had brought you here, and some god had fashioned you, let him obliterate my name and write his own, and the curse fall on him instead of Enkidu. With the first brightening of dawn, Enkidu raised his head and wept before the sun god. In the brilliance of the sunlight, his tears streamed down. Sun god, I beseech you about the vile trapper, that trapper of nothing because of whom I was to catch less than my comrade. Let him catch least, make his game scarce, make him feeble, taking the smallest of every share, let his quarry escape from his nets. When he had cursed the trapper to his heart's content, he turned on the harlot. He was roused to curse her also. As for you, woman, with a great curse I curse you. I will promise you a destiny to all eternity. My curse shall come on you soon and sudden. You shall be without a roof for your commerce, for you shall not keep house with other girls in the tavern, but do your business in places fouled by the vomit of the drunkard. Your hire will be a potter's earth. Your thievings will be flung into the hovel. You will sit at the crossroads in the dust of the potter's quarter. You will make your bed on the dunghill at night, and by day take your stand in the wall's shadow. Brambles and thorns will tear your feet. The drunk and the dry will strike your cheek, and your mouth will ache. Let you be stripped of your purple dyes. For I, too, once in the wilderness with my wife, had all the treasure I wished. When Shamash heard the words of Enkidu, he called to him from heaven, Enkidu, why are you cursing the woman, the mistress who taught you to eat bread fit for gods and drink wine of kings, she who put upon you a magnificent garment? Did she not give you glorious Gilgamesh for your companion? And has not Gilgamesh, your own brother, made you rest on a royal bed and recline on a couch at his left hand? He has made the princes of the earth kiss your feet, and now all the people of Uruk lament and wail over you. When you are dead, he will let his hair grow long for your sake. He will wear a lion's pelt and wander through the desert. When Enkidu heard glorious Shamash, his angry heart grew quiet. He called back the curse and said, Woman, I promise you another destiny. The mouths which cursed you shall bless you. Kings, princes, and nobles shall adore you. On your account, a man, though twelve miles off, will clap his hand to his thigh, and his hair will twitch. For you he will undo his belt, and open his treasure and you shall have your desire, lapis lazuli, gold and carnelian from the heap in the treasury. A ring for your hand and a robe shall be yours. The priest will lead you into the presence of the gods. On your account, a wife, a mother of seven, was forsaken. As Enkidu slept alone in his sickness, in bitterness of spirit, he poured out his heart to his friend. It was I who cut down the cedar, I who leveled the forest, I who slew Humbaba, and now see what has become of me. Listen, my friend, this is the dream I dreamed last night. The heavens roared, the earth rumbled back in answer. Between them I stood before an awful being, the somber-faced man-bird. He had directed on me his purpose. He was a vampire face, his foot was a lion's foot, his hand was an eagle's talon. He fell on me and his claws were in my hair. He held me fast and I smothered. Then he transformed me so that my arms became wings covered with feathers. He turned his stare towards me and he led me away to the palace of Irkala, the queen of darkness, to the house from which none who enters ever returns, down from the road which there is no coming back. There is the house whose people sit in darkness. Dust is their food and clay their meat. They are clothed like birds with wings for covering. They see no light, they sit in darkness. I entered the house of dust, and I saw the kings of the earth. 
their crowns put away forever, rulers and princes, all those who once wore kingly crowns and ruled the world in the days of old. They who had stood in the place of the gods, like Anu and Enlil, stood now like servants to fetch baked meats in the house of dust, to carry cooked meat and cold water from the water skin. In the house of dust which I entered were high priests and acolytes, priests of the incantation and of ecstasy. There were servants of the temple. There was Itana, that king of Kish, whom the eagle carried to heaven in the days of old. I saw also Samkhan, the god of cattle, and there was Ereshkigal, the queen of the underworld, and Belacheri squatted in front of her, she who is recorder of the gods and keeps the book of death. She held a tablet, from which she read. She raised her head. She saw me and spoke. Who has brought this one here? Then I awoke, like a man drained of blood who wanders alone in a waste of rushes, like one whom the bailiff has seized and his heart pounds with terror. Gilgamesh had peeled off his clothes. He listened to his words and wept quick tears. Gilgamesh listened, and his tears flowed. He opened his mouth and spoke to Enkidu. Who is there in strong-walled Uruk who has wisdom like this? Strange things have been spoken. Why does your heart speak strangely? The dream was marvelous, but the terror was great. We must treasure the dream, whatever the terror, for the dream has shown that misery comes at last to the healthy man. The end of life is sorrow, and Gilgamesh lamented. Now I will pray to the great gods, for my friend had an ominous dream. This day on which Enkidu dreamed came to an end, and he lay stricken with sickness. One whole day he lay on his bed, and his suffering increased. He said to Gilgamesh, the friend on whose account he had left the wilderness, Once I ran for you, for the water of life, and now I have nothing. A second day he laid on his bed, and Gilgamesh watched over him, but the sickness increased. A third day he lay on his bed. He called out to Gilgamesh, rousing him up. Now he was weak, and his eyes were blind with weeping. Ten days he lay and his suffering increased. Eleven and twelve days he lay on his bed of pain. Then he called to Gilgamesh, My friend, the great goddess cursed me, and I must die in shame. I shall not die like a man fallen in battle. I feared to fall, but happy is the man who falls in battle, for I must die in shame. And Gilgamesh wept over Enkidu. With the first light of dawn he raised his voice and said to the counselors of Uruk, Hear me. Great ones of Uruk, I weep for Enkidu, my friend. Bitterly moaning like a woman mourning, I weep for my brother. O oh, Enkidu, my brother, you were the axe at my side, my hand strength, the sword in my belt, the shield before me, a glorious robe, my fairest ornament, an evil fate has robbed me, the wild ass and the gazelle, that were father and mother, all long-tailed creatures that nourished you, weep for you, all the wild things of the plain and pastures the paths that you loved in the forest of cedars. Night and day murmur. Let the great ones of strong-walled Uruk weep for you. Let the finger of blessing be stretched out in mourning. Enkidu, young brother, hark. There is an echo all through the country, like a mother mourning. Weep all the paths where we walked together, and the beasts we hunted, the bear and hyena, tiger and panther, leopard and lion, the stag and the ibex, the bull and the doe. The river along whose banks we used to walk weeps for you. Ula of Elam and dear Euphrates, where once we drew water for the water skins, the mountains we climbed, where we slew the watchmen, weeps for you. The warriors of strong-walled Uruk, where the bull of heaven was killed, weep for you. All the people of Eridu weep for you, Enkidu. Those who brought grain for your eating mourn for you now. Who rubbed oil on your back mourn for you now. Who poured beer for your drinking mourn for you now. The harlot who anointed you with fragrant ointment laments for you now. The woman of the palace who brought you a wife, a chosen ring of good advice, lament for you now. And the young men, your brothers, as though they were women, go long-haired in mourning. What is this sleep which holds you now? You are lost in the dark and cannot hear me. He touched his heart, but it did not beat, nor did he lift his eyes again. When Gilgamesh touched his heart, it did not beat. So Gilgamesh laid a veil, as one veils the bride, over his friend. He began to rage like a lion, like a lioness robbed of her whelps. This way and that he paced around the bed, he tore out his hair and strewed it around. He dragged off his splendid robes and flung them down as though they were abominations. 
In the first light of dawn, Gilgamesh cried out, I made you rest on a royal bed. You reclined on a couch at my left hand. The princes of the earth kissed your feet. I will cause all the people of Uruk to weep over you and raise the dirge of the dead. The joyful people will stoop with sorrow, and when you have gone to earth, I will let my hair grow long for your sake. I will wander through the wilderness in the skin of a lion. The next day, also in the first light, Gilgamesh lamented. Seven days and seven nights he wept for Enkidu, until the worm fastened on him. Only then he gave him up to the earth, for the Anunnaki, the judges, had seized him. Then Gilgamesh issued a proclamation through the land. He summoned them all, the coppersmiths, the goldsmiths, the stoneworkers, and commanded them, Make a statue of my friend. The statue was fashioned with a great weight of lapis lazuli for the breast and of gold for the body. A table of hard wood was set out, and on it a bowl of carnelian filled with honey and a bowl of lapis lazuli filled with butter. These he exposed and offered to the sun. And weeping, he went away. Whew! Yeah, that's a rough read. Always, never gets easier. Always has that effect on me. So, now let's, uh, let's analyze it. We open on the homies cleaning off the grime from their fight with Umbaba, but little do they know that Ishtar often tied with Marduk for top spot as the worst one, in my opinion, is Myron. She wants to pee pee, but Gilgamesh expertly curves her, and not only that, absolutely roasts her. In fact, it's more like an arson. Our hero G does not come with a chill setting. He brings up Demuzi slash Tammuz, which, bad call, dude, but we'll get into that later. Remember, Ishtar is a divine, god or alien or something, with powers over reality that we have yet to even begin to comprehend. That's why it's so wrong that this Bronze Age earthling man is oppressing her with his male privilege. So, holy Ishtar caused her mouth to open and spake she thus, Wow, yikes sis, I'm a strong empowered goddess with agency over my own life. How dare you suggest this agency makes me accountable for my own choices? I bet your dick is small. <laughs> You misogynist incel. Then, being the original daddy's money feminist, runs to Anu and demands to use his car. And by car, I mean Gugalana. Some kind of horned, flying, scorpion-shaped combat vehicle. Anu initially refuses, but Inanna threatens to cause a Romero-style zombie apocalypse if he won't, so he relents. This translation actually something says something like, uh, eat food with the living, or eat the food of the living, but I have seen just eat the living as the translation before, and I prefer that one, so I'm gonna go with that one. Most hilarious to me is that she even acknowledges that her behavior is indefensible, but she still persists in responding as if it's Gilgamesh's fault for noticing, which is crazy that she accurately predicted like, this text over 5,000 years ago accurately predicted the behavior of literally every woman nowadays. It's insane. It's incredible. But honestly, like, 30% joking misogyny aside, and though I feel like it should be like libel in the sense of truth being a defense for it anyway, please understand that I suspect this level of power would corrupt anyone, regardless of their sex. And Marduk is worse. Like, you probably notice, I... I I make a lot of fun of Ishtar, and I don't, I really don't like her, but Marduk is worse. I just, I don't know. I suspect maybe Marduk's crimes couldn't have occurred without Ishtar's... I mean, just look at her, or we'll get into it. So anyways, Lumpy Space Princess takes the Bull of Heaven down to Uruk, and the human versus kaiju fight is pretty cool. But, as the armorers are pulling apart the combat vehicle, or whatever it was, Ishtar pops up to lay a curse on our homies, and the particulars of the rest is too sad to relate in detail. I'm amazed I made it through the first time. There is very little I empathize with more than Enkidu's lament of leaving the woods, cursing the trapper and prostitute, and that line about having all the treasure he wanted in the wilderness with his wife. Just, sh shut up, you're not crying, I'm crying. So, Enkidu's dreams are of note. Uh, it calls back, like, symbolism symbolically calls back to the possible rocket launches described at the Cedar Forest, and it features the winged and feathered Anunnaki. 
There are descriptions of working as a servant, deprivation, and people in apparent stasis, including Etana, the that king who was taken up to heaven, from whom we apparently originally get the notion of the earth being a flat disk from, as that is what he saw when taken aloft. That's what he described. That's what the earth looks like from high orbit. Um, to place the story in point of time, we may recall that Ishtar was going down to the underworld to attend the funeral of the Bull of Heaven when all of that drama with Eresh Kigal unfolded, which I have a video on. I guess I'll link it down below somewhere. It seems that there was quite a bit of drama in these last few millennia before the Kali Yuga began, and I can't help but take note of the way that Enlil admonishes Shamash for going about as one of them, consorting with the Earthlings with a level of candor that the Lord of Command is clearly not comfortable with, and this finally brings us back to Demuzi slash Tammuz. So buckle up those tinfoil hats, because your boy is going to speculate about why Enlil says this, referencing what we know from the Spartoli tablets and Genesis, namely that there were wicked gods going around swaying kings to evil just before and directly precipitating the Sodom and Gomorrah incident and the other related catastrophes. I suspect Enlil's admonishment alludes to individuals or small conspiracies of gods going against the establishment divine order, the off-world government referenced in Lord's Prayer, the kingdom that we want to come here on earth as it already is in heaven. If it can happen in the 2200s to like 2000-ish BC with Marduk and Nebu, I'm sure it can happen in like, you know, the 1500, 2000 years before that when this went down. Um, and also actually probably Marduk and Nebu back then, just earlier. Now, we know that Demuzi got got one way or another. And it seems Marduk and Ishtar variously get blamed for it, but the preponderance is Loki slash Marduk killed Baldur slash Demuzi. He seems to be the one who got punished for it, too. But here's the question. Why? Like, what was Demuzi up to? Who would want him dead and why? He seemed to be incredibly close with his people, as related in the Enmerkar text, uh, which I also have a video on, sons of Yafet living in the highlands north and east of Sumer, perhaps linked with the apparently goddess-worshipping based on their iconography, as their writing remains indecipherable, in this valley civilization. So, perhaps Ishtar's center is off in, off in the east, in western India, or I guess what is today Pakistan, whereas Demuzi gets Iran, the highlands, Afghanistan, southern Russia, the steppe, who knows exactly what their purviews were. So here's what I suspect. All three, Marduk, Dabuzi, and Ishtar, were essentially doing the same thing, just from slightly different angles. All were going native in their own ways. Marduk, we know. We, I mean, we seem to be living the consequences of what, what he was doing. Ishtar seemed to just be here to party. And despite, you know, seemingly being entrusted with huge authority as the Lord of Earth, with Enlil having returned to heaven after the Noah Covenant... How do you pronounce that? N-O-A-H-I-C. Noah-ic? The... The, the Covenant, the one with the rainbow. <laughs> um, yeah, despite being entrusted with all this authority, she mostly just used it to get Caveman D and empower a series of unstable gigachads to wreak havoc across Bronze Age Earth. Gilgamesh is actually kind of unique in being one of the few Bronze Age heroes to not be empowered by the Ishtar or Ishtar, you know, Ishtar analog of the culture. So, what about Demuzi, Ishtar's androgynous boy toy? Well, the two seem to get along pretty well. And we know what Ishtar's proclivities were. Did Demuzi perhaps have similar ones? Is Demuzi Krishna? Is Marduk Krishna? Like, it seems to fit in point of time with what is described in Mahabharata and the collapse of the as-yet-untranslated writings, you know, Indus Valley civilization, that seemed to worship Ishtar. Perhaps the events described in Genesis 14 through 19 and Masala Parva are not the same events, but closely related. Is Well, because here's the thing, is a really cool guy very close with these people who are descended from Yafet, it could be Demuzi. Like, I know I'm just, this is all just speculation now. I really don't know, but 
It also could be Marduk. I mean, like, this whole be excellent to each other, but you have to worship only me, dude. That sounds a lot like, you know, the deceiver. So, hmm, it could go either way. Perhaps what what is described in Masala Parva was like round one of what ended up happening eventually, you know, later in the West with uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. I really don't know. And, you know, this is... This whole era of Earth history seems like it was written by Michael Kirkbride, like, in his most spiritual conduit moments of writing Morrowind. And so it's all unreliable narrator and just who knows with any of it, but, I mean, that's what makes Morrowind an excellent game, and since I still do not know how to achieve Chim, or Kim, I don't know how it's pronounced, since I still don't know how to do the IRL version of that, I guess I'm making videos like this. So, yeah. Um, I guess that's all I got for you. This is a, this is a really, really tough one to read, but I'm glad I did, and I decided to, since the, the text was so rough, decided to have some fun with the, with the analysis. So, I hope you all enjoyed. Hope you're having an excellent day and night and whatever, whatever other times of times of time there are. So yeah, keep it 100. Yeet. <laughs> Maybe that's how I should sign off, with just like really cringe things. What's up, nerds? Uh, it's very snowy here. I, you know, snow was a lot more fun when I lived in Texas and didn't have to deal with it, because like it had some mystique. I didn't know that it was just precipitation that like piles up and gets in the way and makes driving really dangerous instead of just like flowing into the gutter the way rain does. So since there's nothing else to do, let's read Tablet 4, The Search for Everlasting Life. Bitterly Gilgamesh wept for his friend Enkidu. He wandered over the wilderness as a hunter. He roamed over the plains. In his bitterness he cried, How can I rest? How can I be at peace? Despair is in my heart. What my brother is now, that shall I be when I am dead. Because I am afraid of death, I will go as best I can to find Utnapishtim, who they call the Far Away, for he has entered the assembly of the gods. So Gilgamesh traveled over the wilderness. He wandered over the grasslands, a long journey in search of Utnapishtim, whom the gods took after the deluge, and they set him to live in the land of Dilmun, in the Garden of the Sun, and to him alone of men they gave everlasting life. At night when he came to the mountain passes, Gilgamesh prayed, In these mountain passes long ago I saw lions. I was afraid, and I lifted my eyes to the moon. I prayed, and my prayers went up to the gods. So now, O moon god Sin, protect me. When he had prayed, he lay down to sleep, until he was woken from out of a dream. He saw the lions round him, glorying in life. Then he took his axe in hand, he drew his sword from his belt, and he fell upon them like an arrow from the string, and struck and destroyed and scattered them. So at length Gilgamesh came to Mashu, the great mountains about which he had heard many things, which guard the rising and the setting sun. Its twin peaks are as high as the wall of heaven, and its paps reach down to the underworld. At its gate the scorpions stand guard, half man and half dragon. Their glory is terrifying. Their stare strikes death into men. Their shimmering halo sweeps the mountains that guards the rising sun. When Gilgamesh saw them, he shielded his eyes for the length of a moment only. Then he took courage and approached. When they saw him so undismayed, the man-scorpion called to his mate, This one who comes to us now is flesh of the gods. The mate of the man-scorpion answered, Two-thirds is god, but one-third is man. Then he called to the man Gilgamesh. He called to the child of the gods. Why have you come so great a journey? For what have you traveled so far, crossing the dangerous waters? Tell me the reason for your coming. Gilgamesh answered, For Enkidu, I loved him dearly. Together we endured all kinds of hardships. On his account I have come, for the common lot of man has taken him. I have wept for him day and night. I would not give up his body for burial. I thought my friend would come back because of my weeping. Since he went, my life is nothing. That is why I have traveled here in search of Utnapishtim, my father. For men say he has entered the assembly of the gods, and has found everlasting life. I have a desire to question him concerning the living and the dead. 
The man scorpion opened his mouth and said, speaking to Gilgamesh, No man born of woman has done what you have asked. No mortal man has gone into the mountain. The length of it is twelve leagues of darkness. In it there is no light, but the heart is oppressed with darkness. From the rising of the sun to the setting of the sun, there is no light. <coughs> Gilgamesh said, Although I should go in sorrow and in pain, with sighing and with weeping, still I must go. Open the gate of the mountain. And the scorpion man said, Go, Gilgamesh, I permit you to pass through the mountain of Mashu, and through the high ranges. May your feet carry you safely home. The gate of the mountain is open. When Gilgamesh heard this, he did as the man scorpion had said. He followed the sun's road to his rising, through the mountain. When he had gone one league, the darkness became thick around him, for there was no light. He could see nothing ahead and nothing behind him. After two leagues, the darkness was thick, and there was no light. He could see nothing ahead and nothing behind him. Do you want to guess what happened after three leagues? I like how earlier they say, at length, he came to the mountain of Mashu. And then, like that, at length, there was no length. It was just <laughs> two words, at length. And here, I'm still looking at it, at the end of six leagues, the darkness was thick and there was no light. He could see nothing ahead and nothing behind him when he had gone seven leagues, the darkness. Um, when he had gone eight leagues, though, Gilgamesh gave a great cry, for the darkness was thick and he could see nothing ahead and nothing behind him. I wonder if when reading that aloud, like, that was kind of a call and response thing with the audience, like, Gilgamesh gave a great cry, like, ah, like a clap to save Tinkerbell kind of thing. After nine leagues, he felt the north wind on his face, but the darkness was thick and there was no light, and he could see nothing ahead and nothing behind him. After ten leagues, the end was near. After eleven leagues, dawn light appeared. At the end of twelve leagues, the sun streamed out. Just as the scorpion man said, twelve leagues. I apologize for my commentary. Back to the story. There was the garden of the gods. All round him stood bushes bearing gems. Seeing it, he went down at once, for there was fruit of carnelian with the vine hanging from it, beautiful to look at. Lapis lazuli leaves hung thick with fruit, sweet to see. For thorns and thistles there were hematite and rare stones, agate and pearls from out of the sea. While Gilgamesh walked in the garden by the edge of the sea, Shamash saw him, and he saw that he was dressed in the skins of animals and ate their flesh. He was distressed, and he spoke and said, No mortal man has gone this way before, nor will, as long as the winds drive over the sea. And to Gilgamesh he said, You will never find the life for which you are searching. Gilgamesh said to glorious Shamash, Now that I have toiled and strayed so far over the wilderness, am I to sleep, and let the earth cover my head forever? Let my eyes see the sun until they are dazzled with looking? Although I am no better than a dead man, still let me see the light of the sun. Beside the sea she lives, the woman of the vine, the, the maker of wine, Siduri, sits in the garden at the edge of the sea, with the golden bowl and the golden vats that the gods gave her. She is covered with a veil, and where she sits, she sees Gilgamesh coming towards her, wearing skins, and the flesh of the gods in his body, but despair in his heart, and his face like the face of one who has made a long journey. She looked, and as she scanned the distance, she said in her own heart, Surely this is some felon. Where is he going now? and she barred her gate against him with the crossbar, and shot home the bolt. But Gilgamesh, hearing the sound of the bolt, threw up his head and lodged his foot in the gate. He called to her, Young woman, maker of wine, why do you bolt your door? What did you see that made you bar your gate? I will break in your door and burst in your gate, for I am Gilgamesh, who seized and killed the bull of heaven. I killed the watchman of the cedar forest. I overthrew Humbaba, who lived in the forest, and I have killed the lions in the passes of the mountain." Then Siduri said to him, If you are that Gilgamesh who seized and killed the bull of heaven, who killed the watchman of the cedar forest, who overthrew Humbaba that lived in the forest and killed the lions in the passes of the mountain, why are your cheeks so starved and why is your face so drawn? Why is despair in your heart and your face like the face of one who has made a long journey? Yes, why is your face burned from the heat and cold? And why do you come here wandering over the pastures in search of the wind? Gilgamesh answered her, and why should not my cheeks be starved and my face drawn? Despair is in my heart, and my face is the face of one who has made a long journey. It was burned with the heat and with cold. Why should I not wander over pastures in search of the wind? My friend, my younger brother, he who hunted the wild ass of the wilderness and the panther of the plains, my friend, my younger brother who seized and killed the bull of heaven and overthrew Humbaba in the cedar forest, my friend, 
who was very dear to me and who endured dangers beside me, Ankidu, my brother, whom I love, the end of mortality has overtaken him. I wept for him seven days and nights till the worm fastened on him. Because of my brother I am afraid of death. Because of my brother I stray through the wilderness and cannot rest. But now, young woman, maker of wine, since I have seen your face, do not let me see the face of death which I dread so much. She answered, Gilgamesh, where are you hurrying to? You will never find that life for which you are looking. When the gods created man, they allotted him death but for life they retained in their own keeping. As for you, Gilgamesh, fill your belly with good things, day and night, night and day, dance and be merry, feast and rejoice. Let your clothes be fresh, bathe yourself in water, cherish the little child that holds your hand, and make your wife happy in your embrace, for this, too, is the lot of man. But Gilgamesh said to Sidiri, the young woman, How can I be silent, how can I rest, when Ankidu, whom I love, is dust, and I too shall die and be laid in the earth? You live by the seashore, and look into the heart of it. Young woman, tell me now, which is the way to Utnapishtim, the son of Ubara Tutu? What directions are there for the passage? Give me, oh, give me directions. I will cross the ocean if it is possible. If it is not, I will wander still farther in the wilderness. The winemaker said to him, Gilgamesh, there is no crossing the ocean. Whoever has come since the days of old has not been able to pass that sea. The sun in his glory crosses the ocean. But who besides Shamash has ever crossed it? The place and the passage are difficult, and the waters of death are deep which flow between. Gilgamesh, how will you cross the ocean? When you come to the waters of death, what will you do? But Gilgamesh, down in the woods you will find Urshanabi, the ferryman of Utnapishtim. With him are the holy things, the things of stone. He is fashioning the serpent prow of the boat. Look at him well. And if it is possible, perhaps you will cross the waters with him. But if it is not possible, then you must go back. When Gilgamesh heard this, he was seized with anger. He took his axe in his hand and his dagger from his belt. He crept forward, and he fell on them like a javelin. Then he went into the forest and sat down. Urshanabi saw the dagger flash and heard the axe, and he beat his head, for Gilgamesh had shattered the tackle of the boat in his rage. Urshanabi said to him, Tell me. What is your name? I am Urshanabi, the fairy man of Utnapishtim the far away. He replied to him, Gilgamesh is my name. I am from Uruk, from the house of Anu. Then Urshanabi said to him, Why are your cheeks so starved and your face so drawn? Why is despair in your heart and your face like the face of one who has made a long journey? Yes, why is your face burned with the heat and with the cold? And why do you come here wandering over the pastures in search of the wind, partner? Gilgamesh said to him, it's the same spiel from before. Now this this is like I feel like the filler episode of the anime. Yeah. So he attributes the attributes the slaying of the bull of heaven to Enkidu again. Explains that he's scared of death because of the death of Enkidu. Therefore, Urshanabi, tell me which is the Okay, yeah. I am afraid of death. Therefore, Urshanabi, tell me which is the road to Utnapishtim. If it is possible, I will cross the waters of death. If not, I will wander still farther through the wilderness. Urshanabi said to him, Gilgamesh, your own hands have prevented you from crossing the ocean. When you destroyed the tackle of the boat, you destroyed its safety. Then the two of them talked it over, and Gilgamesh said, Why are you so angry with me, Urshanabi? For you yourself cross the sea by day and night. At all seasons you cross it. Gilgamesh, those things you destroyed, their property is to carry me over the water, to prevent the waters of death from touching me. It is for this reason that I preserved them, but you have destroyed them, and the Urmu snakes with them. But now go into the forest, Gilgamesh. With your axe, cut poles, 120, cut them 60 cubits long, paint them with bitumen, set them on ferules, and bring them back. When Gilgamesh heard this, he went into the forest. He cut poles, 120. He cut them sixty cubits long, he painted them with bitumen, he set them on ferals, and he brought them to Urshanabi. Then they boarded the boat, Gilgamesh and Urshanabi together, launching it out on the waves of ocean. For three days they ran on it as it were a journey of a month and fifteen days. And at last Urshanabi brought the boat to the waters of death. Then Urshanabi said to Gilgamesh, Press on, take a pole and thrust it in, but do not let your hands touch the waters. Gilgamesh. Take a second pole, take a third, take a fourth pole. Now Gilgamesh, take a fifth, take a set. yep, and keeps going to twelve poles. And after one hundred and twenty thrusts, Gilgamesh had used the last pole. Then he stripped himself and held up his arms for a mast, 
and his coverings for a sail. So Urshanabi the ferryman brought Gilgamesh to Utnapishtim, whom they call the Far Away, who lives in Dilmun, at the place of the sun's transit, eastward of the mountain. To him alone, of the men the gods had given everlasting life. Now Utnapishtim, where he lay at ease, looked into the distance, and he said in his heart, musing to himself, Why does the boat sail here without tackle and mast? Why are the sacred stones destroyed, and why does the master not sail the boat? That man who comes is none of mine. Where I look I see a man whose body is covered with skins of beasts. Who is this who walks up the shore behind Urshanabi? For surely he is no man of mine. So Utnapishtim looked at him and said, What is your name, you who have come here wearing the skins of beasts, with your cheeks starved and your face drawn? Where are you hurrying to now? For what reason have you made this great journey, crossing the seas whose passage is difficult? Tell me the reason for your coming. He replied, Gilgamesh is my name. I am from Uruk, from the house of Anu. Then Utnapishtim said to him, If you are Gilgamesh, why are your cheeks so starved and your face drawn? Why is your heart... <laughs> why... <laughs> uh, it's the same formula again. Why is despair in your heart? Why is your face burned with heat and cold and why... It's, it's just hard to do that voice as much as I think it's funny. Gilgamesh said to him, Why should not my cheeks be starved and my face drawn? Despair is in my heart, and... Yes, repeating the same formula again. Friend killed the bull of heaven, overthrew him, Baba. Wept for him for seven days and nights till the worm fastened on him. Because of my brother, I am afraid of death. Because of my brother, I stray through the wilderness. His fate lies heavy upon me. How can I be silent? How can I rest? He is dust, and I shall die also, and be laid in the earth forever. Again, Gilgamesh said, speaking to Utnapishtim, It is to see Utnapishtim, whom we call the far away, that I have come this journey. For this I have wandered over the world, I have crossed many difficult ranges, I have crossed the seas, I have wearied myself with traveling, my joints are aching, and I have lost acquaintance with sleep, which is sweet. My clothes were worn out before I came to the house of Siduri, I have killed the bear and hyena, the lion and panther, the tiger, the stag, and the ibex, all sorts of wild game, and the small creatures of the pastures. I ate their flesh and I wore their skins, and that was how I came to the gate of the young woman the maker of wine, who barred her gate of pitch and bitumen against me. But from her I had news of the journey. So then I came to Urshanabi the ferryman, and with him I crossed over the waters of death. O father Utnapishtim, you who have entered the assembly of the gods, I wish to question you concerning the living and the dead. How shall I find the life for which I am searching? Utnapishtim said, There is no permanence. Do we build a house to stand forever? Do we seal a contract to hold for all time? Do brothers divide an inheritance to keep forever? Does the flood time of rivers endure? It is only the nymph of the dragonfly who sheds her larva and sees the sun in his glory. From the days of old there is no permanence. The sleeping and the dead, how alike they are. They are like a painted death. What is there between the master and the servant when both have fulfilled their doom? When the Anunnaki, the judges, come together, and Mamatun, the mother of destinies, together, they decree the fates of men. Life and death they allot, but the day of death they do not disclose. Then Gilgamesh said to Utnapishtim the far away, I look at you now, Utnapishtim, and your appearance is no different from mine. There is nothing strange in your features. I thought I should find you like a hero prepared for battle. But you lie here, taking your ease on your back. Tell me truly, how was it that you came to enter the company of the gods and to possess everlasting life? Utnapishtim said to Gilgamesh, I will reveal to you a mystery. I will tell you a secret of the gods. And so that concludes part four of the Gilgamesh epic. Um, as I mentioned during the story, during the editorializing of mine during the story, uh, I feel like this one is kind of filler filler-ish. I think it's possibly a later interpolation. Um, I, I don't know. I kind of, uh, there's definitely some cool stuff in it. It just feels like everything mentioned in the story is, it's referencing concepts that I've already established and tried to, you know, provide a theoretical explanation for in previous videos of mine, like the Scorpion Men are probably some sort of Galu demon or robot or something. I don't know. Um, it is kind of interesting to see, like, Shamash, the dude, hanging out in 
this place, Dilmun, the land of the living, like, I guess, uh, you know, um, I guess I could go into Sitchin's arguments on this subject, but, like, I don't know, I guess I just don't find them that compelling. I don't know if he's wrong, I just don't think his argumentation is the best. Um, it is nice to see Shamash, though, hanging out in, like, I guess, just Willy Wonka's, like, indoor boat candy garden thing. And <laughs> just, like, uh, it's also interesting to see all the, everyone there, just total, like, Vaishnava dudes, you know, hanging out, and like, whoa, man, eating meat and, like, wearing skins, bro, how barbaric. It's, a. Uh, I don't know, it seems fitting, actually, like, I'm, it sounds like I'm making fun of it, but it sounds about right. Um, yeah. And the fact that it ends on a cliffhanger, I don't know, just feels kind of cringe. But it's, it's kind of late and I'm tired and I got some stuff I gotta do early, early tomorrow in the morning. Otherwise I would have just kept going and read the, the next bit about the Great Flood, because it's, it's pretty neat, but I'll leave that one for next time. Um, what else is there? Oh, yeah, y'all know I've been, I've been kind of struggling with coming up with a way to, like, reliably sign off of these videos in just, like, a handy, neat way, and I was watching this, uh, a video from this channel called Black Conservative Perspective, and the way he signed off was just perfect, like, this rapid-fire, like, uh, telling people to comment, like, and share a Black Conservative Perspective piece. Boom, just like really quick, really concise, hits all the major points. And so I think I'm just going to copy him, like just verbatim, unchanged. So let me know what you guys think. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe, and most importantly, share a black conservative perspective. Peace. So <clears throat> I fear that I made an error in committing to doing the voice of Utna Pishtim in my, in my best impression of George Takei's voice. Uh, s because this this chapter is just entirely Utnapishtim speaking. Almost entirely Utnapishtim speaking. And kind of the reason that I was doing those voices before was to have, like, a, um, a direct auditory marker of who is speaking so you don't have to keep track of, and then Gilgamesh caused his mouth to open and spake thus, etc., etc. Like, just, oh, uh, Urshanabi sounds like a hillbilly. Oh, uh, Utnapishtim sounds like George Decay. Etc. Etc. Um, but since that voice is kind of hard to do, and this is all Utna Pishtim speaking, I'm just gonna just gonna read it in my normal voice, unless he's quoting someone else, and then I will do a different voice. All right. Without further ado, Tablet Five: The Story of the Flood. You know the city Shurapak. It stands on the banks of Euphrates. That city grew old, and the gods that were in it were old. There was Anu, Lord of the Firmament, their father and Warrior and Leel their counselor, Ninurta the helper, and Enugi the watcher over canals, and with them was also Ea. In those days the world teemed, the people multiplied, the world bellowed like a wild bull, and the great god was aroused by the clamor. And Leel heard the clamor and said to the gods in council, The uproar of mankind is intolerable, and sleep is no longer possible by reason of the babble. So the gods agreed to exterminate mankind. And Leel did this, but Ia, because of his oath, warned me in a dream. He whispered the words to my house of reeds. Reed house. Reed house, wall, O oh wall, hearken. Reed house, wall, reflect, O oh man of Shurapak, son of Ubara Tutu. Tear down your house and build a boat. Abandon possessions and look for life. Despise worldly goods and save your soul alive. Tear down your house, I say, and build a boat. These are the measurements of the bark as you shall build her. Let her beam equal her length. Let her deck be roofed over like the vault that covers the abyss, and take up into the boat the seed of all living creatures. When I understood, I said to my lord, Behold, what you have commanded I will honor and perform, but how shall I answer the people of the city, the elders? Then Ea opened his mouth and said to me, his servant, Tell them this. I have learnt that Enlil is wrathful against me, and I dare no longer walk in his land, nor live in his city. I will go down to the gulf to dwell with Ea, my lord. But on you he will rain down abundance, rare fish and shy wild fowl, a rich harvest tide in the evening. The rider of the storm will bring you wheat in torrents. 
In the first light of dawn, all my household gathered round me. The children brought pitch, and the men whatever was necessary. On the fifth day, I laid the keel and the ribs. Then I made fast the planking. The ground space was one acre. Each side of the deck measured 120 cubits, making a square. I built six decks below, seven in all. I divided them into nine sections with bulkheads between. I drove in wedges where needed. I saw to the punt holes and laid in supplies. The carriers brought oil and baskets. I poured pitch into the furnace and asphalt and oil. More oil was consumed in caulking, and more again the master of the boat took into his stores. I slaughtered bullocks for the people, and every day I killed sheep. I gave the shipwrights wine to drink as though it were river water, raw wine and red wine and oil and white wine. There was feasting then, as there is at the time of the New Year's festival. I myself anointed my head. On the seventh day the boat was complete. Then was the launching full of difficulty. There was shifting of ballast above and below till two-thirds was submerged. I loaded into her all that I had of gold and of living things, my family, my kin, the beast of the field, both wild and tame, and all the craftsmen. I sent them on board, for the time that Shamash had ordained was already fulfilled when he said, In the evening when the rider of the storm sends down the destroying rain, enter the boat and batten her down. The time was fulfilled. The evening came. The rider of the storm sent down the rain. I looked out at the weather, and it was terrible. So I too boarded the boat and battered her down, battened her down. All was now complete, the battening and the caulking. So I handed the tiller to Puzu Amuri, the steersman, with the navigation and the care of the whole boat. With the first light of dawn, a black cloud came from the horizon. It thundered within where Hadad, lord of the storm, was riding. In front, over the hill and the plain of Shulat and Hanish, heralds of the storm led on. Then the gods of the abyss rose up. Nurgle pulled out the dams of the nether waters. Ninurta the warlord threw down the dikes, and the seven judges of hell, the Anunnaki, raised their torches, lighting the land with their livid flame. A stupor of despair went up to heaven when the gods of the storm turned daylight to darkness, when he smashed the land like a cup. One whole day the tempest raged, gathering fury as it went, it poured over the people like the tides of battle. A man could not see his brother nor the people be seen from heaven. Even the gods were terrified at the flood. They fled to the highest heaven, the firmament of Anu. They crouched against the walls, cowering like curs. Then Ishtar, the sweet-voiced queen of heaven, cried out like a woman in travail. Alas, the days of old are turned to dust because I commanded evil. Why did I command this evil? in the council of all gods sorry this uh for once it's not a lacuna in the text itself it's this copy of penguin classics it's all worn away i commanded wars to destroy the people but are they not my people for i brought them forth now like the spawn of fish they float in the ocean the great gods of heaven and hell wept they covered their mouths for six days and nights the winds blew torrent and tempest and flood overwhelmed the world Tempest and flood raged together like warring host, warring hosts. When the seventh day dawned, the storm from the south subsided. The sea grew calm. The flood was stilled. I looked at the face of the world, and there was silence. All mankind was turned to clay. The surface of the sea stretched as flat as a rooftop. I opened a hatch, and light fell on my face. Then I bowed low. I sat down, and I wept. The tears streamed down my face, for on every side was the waste of water. I looked for land in vain, but fourteen leagues distant there appeared a mountain, and there the boat grounded on the mountain of Nisir, the boat held fast. She held fast and did not budge. One day she held, and a second day on the mountain of Nisir she held fast and did not budge. When the seventh day dawned, I loosed a dove and let her go. She flew away, but finding no resting place she returned. Then I loosed a swallow, and she flew away, but finding no resting place, she returned. I loosed a raven. She saw that the waters had retreated. She ate. She flew around. She cawed. And she did not come back. Then I threw everything open to the four winds. I made a sacrifice, and poured out a libation on the mountaintop. Seven, and again seven cauldrons I set up on their stands. I heaped up wood and cane and cedar and myrtle. When the gods smelled the sweet savor, they gathered like flies over the sacrifice. Then, at last, Ishtar also came. She lifted her necklace with the jewels of heaven that Anu once had made to please her. O oh, you gods here present by the lapis lazuli round my neck, I shall remember these days as I remember the jewels of my throat.
These last days I shall not forget. Let all the gods gather round the sacrifice except Enlil. He shall not approach this offering, for without reflection he brought the flood and consigned my people to destruction. When Enlil had come, when he saw the boat, he was wroth, and swelled with anger at the gods, the host of heaven. Has any of these mortals escaped? Not one was to have survived the destruction. Then the gods of the wells and canals, Ninurta opened his mouth, and said to the warrior Enlil, Who is there of the gods that can devise without Ea? It is Ea alone who knows all things. Then Ea opened his mouth and spoke to warrior Enlil, Wisest of gods, hero Enlil, how could you so senselessly bring down the flood? Lay upon the sinner his sin, lay upon the transgressor his transgression. Punish, punish him a little when he breaks loose. Do not drive him too hard or he perishes. Would that a lion had ravaged mankind rather than the flood. Would that a wolf had ravaged mankind rather than the flood. Would that a famine had wasted the world rather than the flood. Would that a pestilence had wasted mankind rather than the flood. It was not I that revealed the secret of the gods. The wise man learned it in a dream. Now take your counsel what shall be done with him. Then Enlil went up into the boat. He took me by the hand and my wife and made us enter the boat and kneel down on either side. He, standing between us, he touched our foreheads to bless us, saying, In time past, Utnapishtim was a mortal man. Henceforth he and his wife shall live in the distance at the mouth of the rivers. Thus it was that the gods took me and placed me here to live in the distance at the mouth of the rivers. Chapter 6. The Return Utnapishtim said, As for you, Gilgamesh, who will assemble the gods for your sake, so that you may find the life for which you are searching? But, if you wish, come and put it to the test. Only prevail against sleep for six days and seven nights. But while Gilgamesh sat there resting on his haunches, a mist of sleep like soft wool teased from the fleece drifted over him. And Utnapishtim says to his wife, and Utnapishtim said to his wife, Look at him now, the strong man who would have everlasting, everlasting life. Even now the mists of sleep are drifting over him. His wife replied, Touch the man to wake him, so that he may return to his own land in peace, going back through the gate by which he came. Utnapishtim said to his wife, All men are deceivers. Even you he will attempt to deceive. Therefore bake loaves of bread. Each day one loaf, and put it beside his head, and make a mark on the wall to number the days he has slept. So she baked loaves of bread, each day one loaf, and put it beside his head, and she marked on the wall the days that he slept, and there came a day when the first loaf was hard. The second loaf was like leather, the third was soggy, the crust of the fourth had mold, and the fifth was mildewed, the sixth and the seventh was still on the embers. Then Utna Pishtim touched him, and he woke. Gilgamesh said to Utnapishtim the far away, I hardly slept when you touched and roused me. But Utnapishtim said, Count these loaves of bread, and learn how many days you slept. For your first is hard, your second is like leather, your third is soggy, the crust of your fourth has mold, your fifth is mildewed, your sixth is fresh, and your seventh was still over the glowing embers when I touched and woke you. Gilgamesh said, What shall I do, O Utnapishtim? Where shall I go? Already the thief in the night has hold of my limbs. Death inhabits my room. Wherever my foot rests, there I find death. Then Utnapishtim spoke to Urshanabi, the ferryman. Woe to you, Urshanabi! Now and forevermore you have become hateful to this harborage. It is not for you, nor for you are the crossings of this sea. Go now, banished from the shore. But this man, before whom you walked, bringing him here, whose body is covered with foulness, and the grace of whose limbs has been spoiled by wild skins, take him to the washing place. There he shall wash his long hair clean as snow in the water. He shall throw off his skins and let the sea carry them away, and the beauty of his body shall be shown. The fillet of his forehead shall be renewed, and he shall be given clothes to cover his nakedness. Till he reaches his own city and his journey is accomplished, these clothes will show no sign of age. They will wear like a new garment. So Urshanabi took Gilgamesh and led him to the washing place. He washed his long hair as clean as snow in the water. He threw off his skins which the sea carried away and showed the beauty of his body. 
He renewed the fillet on his forehead, and to cover his nakedness gave him clothes which would show no sign of age, but would wear like new gar but would wear like new garments until he reached his own city, and his journey was accomplished. Then Gilgamesh and Urshanabi launched the boat onto the water and boarded it, and they made ready to sail away. But the wife of Utnapishtim, the far away, said to him, Gilgamesh came here wearied out. He is worn out. What will you give him to carry back to his own country? So Utnapishtim spoke, and Gilgamesh took a pole and brought the boat into the bank. Gilgamesh, you came here a man wearied out. You have worn yourself out. What shall I give you to carry back to your own country? Gilgamesh, I shall reveal a secret thing. It is a mystery of the gods that I am telling you. There is a plant, <clears throat> there is a plant that grows under the water. It has a prickle like a thorn, like a rose. It will wound your hands. But if you succeed in taking it, then your hands will hold that which restores his lost youth to a man. When Gilgamesh heard this, he opened the sluices so that sweet water current might carry him out to the deepest channel. He tied heavy stones to his feet, and they dragged him down to the waterbed. There he saw the plant growing. Although it pricked him, he took it in his hands. Then he cut the heavy stones from his feet, and the sea carried him and threw him onto the shore. Gilgamesh said to Urshanabi the ferryman, Come here and see this marvelous plant. By its virtue a man may win back all his former strength. I will take it to Uruk of the strong walls. There I will give it to the old men to eat. Its name shall be, The Old Men Are Young Again. And at last I shall eat it myself and have back all my lost youth. So Gilgamesh returned by the gate through which he had come, Gilgamesh and Urshanabi together. They traveled their twenty leagues and then broke their fast. After thirty leagues they stopped for the night. Gilgamesh saw a well of cool water and he went down and bathed. But deep in the pool there was lying a serpent, and the serpent sensed the sweetness of the flower. It rose out of the water and snatched it away, and it, immediately it sloughed its skin and returned to the well. Then Gilgamesh sat down and wept. The tears ran down his face, and he took the hand of Urshanabi. O oh, Urshanabi, was it for this that I toiled with my hands? Is it for this I have wrung out my heart's blood? For myself I have gained nothing. Not I, but the beast of the earth has joy of it now. Already the stream has carried it twenty leagues back to the channels where I found it. I found a sign, and now I have lost it. Let us leave the boat on the bank and go. After twenty leagues they broke their fast. After thirty leagues they stopped for the night. In three days they had walked as much of a, as a journey of a month and fifteen days. When the journey was accomplished, they arrived at Uruk, the strong-walled city. Gilgamesh spoke to him, to Urshanabi the ferryman. Urshanabi, climb up to the wall of Uruk, inspect its foundation terrace, and examine well the brickwork. See if it is not burnt bricks and did not the seven wise men lay these foundations. One-third of the whole is city, one-third is garden, and one-third is field, with the precinct of the goddess Ishtar. These parts are, and the precinct are all Uruk. This too was the work of Gilgamesh, the king who knew the countries of the world. He was wise, and he saw mysteries and knew secret things. He brought us a tale of the days before the flood. He went on a long journey, was weary, worn out with labor, and returning engraved on a stone the whole story. Tablet 7. The Death of Gilgamesh The destiny was fulfilled which the father of the gods and Leal of the mountain had decreed for Gilgamesh. In the nether earth the darkness will show him a light. Of mankind, all that are known, none will leave a moment for generations to come to compare with his. The heroes, the wise men, like the new moon, have their waxing and waning. Men will say, who has ever ruled with might and power like him? As in the dark month, the month of shadows, so without him there is no light. O oh, Gilgamesh, this was the meaning of your dream. You were given the kingship, such was your destiny. Everlasting life was not your destiny. Because of this do not be sad at heart, do not be grieved or oppressed. He has given you power to bind and to loose, and to be the darkness and the light of mankind. He has given you unexpected... He has given unexampled supremacy over the people, victory in battle from which no fugitive returns, in forays and assaults from which there is no going back. But do not abuse this power. Deal justly with your servants in the palace, and justly before the face of the sun. The king has laid himself down, and will not rise again. The lord of Kulab will not rise again. He overcame evil. He will not come again. Though he was strong of arm, he will not rise again. He had wisdom and a comely face. He will not come again. 
He has gone into the mountains. He will not come again. On the bed of fate he lies. He will not rise again. From the couch of many colors, he will not come again. The people of the city, great and small, are not silent. They lift up the lament. All men of flesh and blood lift up the lament. Fate has spoken. Like a hooked fish he lies stretched on the bed. Like a gazelle that is caught in a noose. Inhuman Namtar is heavy upon him, Namtar that has neither hand nor foot, that drinks no water and eats no meat. For Gilgamesh, son of Ninsun, they weighed out their offerings. His dear wife, his son, his concubine, his musicians, his jester, and all his household. His servants, his stewards, and all who lived in the palace weighed out their offerings for Gilgamesh, the son of Ninsun, the heart of Uruk. They weighed out their offerings to Ereshkigal, the queen of death, and to all the gods of the dead, to Namtar, who is fate, they weighed out the offering. Bread for Neti, the keeper of the gate. Bread for Ningizida, the god of the serpent, the lord of the tree of life. For Dumuzi also, the young shepherd. For Anki, and Ninki, and Endukuga, and Nindukuga, and Enmol, and Ninmol, all the ancestral gods, forebears of Enlil. A feast for Shulpei, the god of feasting. For Samquan, the god of herds. For the mother Ninhursag, and the gods of creation in the place of creation. For the hosts of heaven, priest and priestess, weighed out the offering of the dead. Gilgamesh, the son of Ninsun, lies in the tomb. At the place of offering, he weighed the bread offering. At the place of libation, he poured out the wine. In those days, the Lord Gilgamesh departed, the son of Ninsun, the king, peerless, without equal among men who did not neglect and leal his master. O Gilgamesh, Lord of Kulab, great is thy praise. The End So, um, once again, like in the last video, there's not really a whole lot to analyze here, um, partially because it's all stuff I've referenced before, and partially because, um, I mean, I've actually, I think I've done this exact passage, just a slightly different translation before, in my, uh, one of my earliest videos, the Anthropogenesis and Deluge video. Interesting, interesting things. Is Enugi the same guy as Enoch? Like, it seems plausible. I'm not sure. I wish this, this version described Enki as crossing his fingers when the other gods made him swear not to warn mankind about the flood. That's a... I think, I think that's a, a funny detail that I've seen in other, other versions of this story. What else we got? Um, Shamash. Uh, is the same guy who warned Utnapishtim about the coming of the Flood. Um, on their time scale, I think that the Flood, like, just happened. You know, to, uh, even though it's like 9,000 years before these events, on an Earthling time scale, uh, this may be the same thing that Enlil is referring to when he admonishes Shamash for going about as one of them with the Earthlings. Uh, it seems like the allegiances are something like Shamash and Ia are more sympathetic to the Earthlings, whereas Enlil, Ninurta, Nurgle, etc. Um, they're not as shy about using force to, to get what they want. The, it seems like uh, Shamash and Ia will use counsel and subterfuge and articulating what they mean whereas Enlil, Ninurta, and Nurgle all have a hammer, so every problem looks like a nail. Mm. I apologize for... Uh, I feel like I'm coming down with something, and my cat is also bothering me, so I uh, apologize if I don't sound great in this video. Um, just want to get through, get through this story. Uh, yeah, so it kind of sounds like, and this is something that Sitchin has said before, from these texts, it sounds like 
the deluge was not something that the Lord God just magically made happen. It sounds like it was a a thing that was going to happen, and they just neglected to warn humans about it. Uh, or neglected to warn the earthlings about it. Because as far as I can tell, like, if they can interbreed and have fertile offspring with us, that makes them us. So, like, by the laws of speciation. Um, or perhaps the lack of ability to produce fertile offspring is something to do with the the snake, Ia's symbol, um, getting Eve to eat the apple, and the only thing that changes is they notice that they're naked. And that's the only reason that the Lord God knows, I mean, in the Genesis story, could have something to do with the the issue of fertile offspring by reproduction between Homo sapiens Terrans, us, and, like, Homo sapiens Nibiruans, or whatever they would be called. And I say this because the gods climb up to heaven to escape the flood. Like, this is a, a an actual cataclysm happening on the planet that they're occupying, and so they gotta they got a bail. Ishtar, I commanded wars to destroy the people, she says. I'm telling you, this chick is just here to party. She is treating the earth like her own reality show. Just, she gets a little bit bored and she's like, hmm, I guess I'm gonna go try to bang Gilgamesh or I'm gonna go just precipitate violent conflict for some reason. Because life isn't already hard enough I'm just going to present, I'm going to make up and present a bunch of difficulties that otherwise do not need to exist. Which is, again, like, an incre it's incredible that this book, 5,000 years ago, predicts the behavior of every modern woman. I believe this is the last time that Enlil or Ia are seen on Earth, like, chronologically, in the events that are happening on Earth. This is the last time Enlil and Ia are literally directly there. After this, it's all Ishtar, Marduk, Nabu, Nurgle, Nanurta. It's all the second generation gods, I guess. Um, so yeah, uh, the gods come to Noah's barbecue. And it's, it's such a good barbecue that they make the Noah Covenant, and they take him to live at the mouth of the rivers. So, this seems to, I mean, uh, in every other aspect, and along with this, seems to jive with the biblical story of the Flood, including landing at the twin-peaked mountain uh, north of Sumeria, where the, the headwaters of the rivers, presumably the Tigris and Euphrates, are, thus Ararat, just like in the Bible. Not a lot to say about the next chapter. Um, all this stuff... Uh, I was looking at the glossary of, like, or uh, the sources, I mean, citations, and uh, I was right about the last video and the death of Enkidu, that these are, like, 11th century Babylonian versions, and that's why they, they are so incredibly repetitive and lame. Who stole the special plant that Gilgamesh got? Who's the snake? The snake that took the, the special plant. Also, possibly related, who is Puzur Amuri? Or I think I've seen it as Puzur Amuru? The steersman. I know Puzur. Puzur means servant, right? I'm not sure who this guy is. I want to look into that. Who Puzur might be. Because if, if he's the steersman and he knows to take it, he knows to take it to Ararat and how, I would suspect he's perhaps not just some guy. But, I mean, to be an off-worlder willing to surf a worldwide cataclysm in a homemade boat that, like, some basically Neolithic humans homemade... That's some balls, dude. Like, I gotta respect that. And the death of Gilgamesh. I mean... I'm not crazy about that ending. Like, uh, it's... I don't like how he quotes from Enkidu, or how, or I suppose, the the Babylonian compilers, re retranslators, basically borrow what Enkidu says to him. 
I think it would be better if they borrowed what? Oh God, what was the winemaker's name? Sidiri. I think it would work better if they borrowed what Sidiri said. Something about the, you know, love your wife, uh, take joy from the little child that holds your, holds your hand, etc., etc. That seems like a lot more of the lesson of this book than, than whatever else. Um, I guess it is, it is pretty cool to have Enlil himself deliver your eulogy. He references, uh, Namtar. Where does he say it? Oh, yeah. Namtar has neither hand nor foot. Namtar that has neither hand nor foot, that drinks no water and eats no meat. So is he a Galu demon, too? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know, I guess I could read through the glossary of terms and whatever, or glossary of names, appendix, sources. I could go through that, but I really don't feel like it. So I guess I'm just going to post some pictures of, of the surrounding content of this, and y'all can... Y'all can look through it if the video quality is good enough to, to look at. Or, I mean, freaking just go down to your local bookstore and look for some Penguin Classics and read this yourself. I don't, I don't want to hear... I, I know in the past I've said, like, hey, please like and comment and tell me what you think. Tell me if you think I'm wrong. You know, actually, I don't care. I want you to go read this stuff and come up with your own beliefs about it. Like, if you're just going to take what somebody else says at face value and be like, yeah, that's that's totally it, then chances are you're going to do that with someone who is not 100% correct about literally everything they say all the time, like me. So, I mean, it just seems like a bad... A, it seems like a bad plan. You know? Just just trust yourself and the, and assume that you are never, ever wrong. There you go. That's the way to do it. Um, so, final thoughts, and speaking of never being wrong, um, I could be wrong about the location of the Twin Peak Mountain. It could be the Lebanon and anti-Lebanon mountains, and it would make sense with them specifying that the sun sets behind it, and the Sea of Death being nearby... Sounds like, yeah, the, the Dead Sea is around there. Maybe the plant we can formulate some eternal life juice from grows at the bottom of that. And lastly, I find it utterly fascinating that Ea advises Utnapishtim to say that he's moving due to animosity between his patron god, Ea, and Enlil, who rules the territory he currently resides in. Uh, Shurapak, I think he mentioned it was. Says he's going down, the gulf, down to the Gulf, south to the coast of the Persian Gulf, is Eridu, which is Ia's territory, along with Africa, and I would imagine just from the, the huge snake symbolism, possibly North America, Central America as well. I don't know. Um, but the point is, I'm not just making it up about the allotted territories these gods administers and the strife between the governors of these regions, which is something I posited and referenced, etc., whatever, in the Enmerkar, Enmerkar and the Lord of Arata, video. So yeah, let me know what you guys think. Remember to like, comment, subscribe, and most importantly, share a black conservative perspective. Peace. So this is a companion video to my five part, or I actually can't remember how many parts I did. I think it was five. Um, five part video series on the Epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, something from the introduction stuck with me that I feel like needed elaboration on, I suppose. So, uh, I'll just read it for you on screen now. I have not followed other versions in giving the epic in verse, believing that prose will provide a more direct and flexible means of communication, particularly in difficult passages, and for the same reason I have given up the division into tablets. Within the framework of the text, there is still room for considerable variety of approach and interpretation as a comparison of the different translations in existence soon shows. 
My aim throughout has been intelligibility, and as far as the surviving texts allow, a smooth and consistent story. Any version that aims at a unified narrative must be a collation. The, quote, standard text, unquote, created by the scribes of Ashurbanipal in the 7th century was a collation, and so are all the modern versions. I have departed from the more usual practice by employing the Sumerian sources alongside the Akkadian and Hittite. This is not only because of their priority, and the fact that the Akkadian writers themselves drew on the Sumerian cycle for the basis of most of the episodes in their epic, but also because they fill important gaps, particularly in the forest journey, and they alone provide the destiny and the death of Gilgamesh. Uh, both destiny, Gilg uh, all three, forest journey, death, uh, destiny and death of Gilgamesh, in quotes there, being titles of passages. Moreover, their quality is very high. <clears throat> I guess uh, that's a good enough place to stop. I I think he, this author, collator, translator, whatever, made the right decision there. Uh, I kind of agree with him. Similarly, you know, to my decision to divide the videos up into tablets, despite the fact that they are videos. It's basically the same story, just, you know, depends on how it's told and with my weird interpretations tacked onto the end. And so, given that, I thought it would behoove me to show y'all all the relevant passages from cune <clears throat> these passages from cuneiform parallels to the Old Testament. Just remove all the poeticization. It's funny because he takes it out of verse, but you know what I mean. Like, uh, just provide you the literal source material evidence not dressed up at all, so that you can form your own decision for yourself. Okay, here we go. Uh, the epic consisted originally of twelve large tablets, every one of which had three columns of writing on both obverse and reverse. Many of these have come to us in sadly broken condition, and some of only fragments remain. The text, as we have it, belonged to the great library of Ashurbanipal, 668 to 626 BC, and is written for the most part in Assyrian script, though a few fragments are in Neo-Babylonian. The name of the poet who produced this version is Sin Liki Unini, but there are numerous allusions on the tablet to their having been copied from older originals, and two such have been preserved, which were written during the First Babylonian Dynasty, circa 2000 BC. The poem contains the stories of the great deeds and wonderful adventures of Gilgamesh, the ruler of Uruk, an historical personage originally to whose illustrious name these clouds of myth and legend have been attached. The episode of the deluge is here given in full, but in order that its relationship to the whole epic may be understood, a synopsis of the epic, with illustrative extracts, is given first. First Tablet Who saw everything? Lacuna of the land, who Lacuna learned to know, understood everything. Lacuna altogether, Lacuna. The mysteries of wisdom, everything, Lacuna. The mysterious he saw, the concealed he looked upon. Tidings of the time before the deluge did he bring. A fair journey, di a far journey did he make, wearying himself and Lacuna, and upon a stone tablet did write all sufferings. He built the wall of peace-loving Uruk. After a break comes the striking line, itself broken, but restored from another passage. Two-thirds of him is God, one-third of him is man. The tablet then goes on to narrate how he drove the people of Uruk to such heavy labors upon the city walls that they at length appealed to the gods for deliverance from their bondage. The gods hearkened to their plaint and beseeched the goddess Aruru, who had created Gilgamesh, to create a rival for him, that he might draw the attention of the tyrant to other things. Column 2. When Aruru heard this, she made in her heart a man after the likeness of Anu. Aruru washed her hands, took a piece of clay, and spat upon it. Engidu, she created, the hero, a lofty offering, a ruler of Ninib. Engidu was covered in hair, and lived his life among the wild beasts, protecting them against the hunters and trappers. In this free life among the beasts, he came into conflict with the huntsmen and complained to his Gilgamesh on the advice of those. Yeah, so, as you can see, it is basically the text that I read from the Penguin 
classics. You know, uh, some liberties have been taken with it. Some, uh, you know, they just just brought it up into the 90s a little bit. It's, I think it's perfectly acceptable. And I also think it's perfectly acceptable when Sitchin does that with, like, the book of Anki. But, of course, pseudo, pseudo, pseudo. Sorry, I'm getting off topic. <clears throat> tablet 2. Um, the beginning of the second tablet is so badly broken that 50 lines are wanting. From the fragments that remain, we learn that Enkidu, enticed by the lure of the wilderness, had left Gilgamesh and returned to his friendly beasts, among whom he lamented the enticements of the harlot, which had taken him away to the city. But the sun god Shamash cried to him out of heaven that she had rather brought him only to good to divine... only to good to divine food and royal drink and festival garb. Moved by the words of the god, Engidu returned to Uruk, where a terrible dream came to him, and is related to Gilgamesh. My friend, a dream I saw in the night. The heavens thundered, the earth answered, before a mighty one I stood. Lacuna somber was his visage. The mighty creature must have been a demon from the underworld who caught Engidu away into the dark abodes of death. To that dwelling which one enters, but comes not forth again. To that road whose course returns not again. To that dwelling whose inhabitants light is denied. Where earth is their food, clay is their repast. Covered are they, like birds, with feathers. And the light they behold not, in darkness they dwell. What the meaning of the dream may be is unknown to us. Perhaps it is ominous of Angadu's death. At the end of the tablet, we find the two friends planning a great journey against Humbaba. <clears throat> you know what, I'm just going to say Humbaba, because trying to pronounce it like Humbaba, I'm probably just going to say Enkidu also. I don't know why it's with a G here. I mean, it doesn't seem that super wrong, I'm just used to saying Humbaba and Enkidu. Anyways, uh, journey against Humbaba, the Elamite warder of the Cedar Mountains, of Irnini, that is, Ishtar. The thought of it would seem to be that Gilgamesh goes out to rescue from this forest the statue of the goddess. Perhaps this portion of the epic rests upon the historical event of the carrying away into Elam of a goddess image by, who oh boy, Kuturnankundi, Kuturnankundi, which Asher Banipal says occurred 1635 years before his time. Tablet 3. <coughs> Tablet 3 Gilgamesh opened his mouth and spoke. He said to Enkidu, My friend, let us go to the great palace, to the servant of Ninsun, the great queen, to Rishat Ninlil, who is mistress of all knowledge. Gilgamesh then introduces his mother to make an offering to Shamash, doubtless to secure his favor upon the great undertaking, and perhaps also to secure an oracle concerning its success. Tablet 4. The fragmentary character of this tablet makes it very difficult to recover a connected narrative. So far as we can see at the beginning, the friends are in dispute, Engidu striving to induce Gilgamesh to abandon the foolhardy expedition. But they set out, nevertheless, and approach the cedar mountain where the god Enlil has set the fearsome Khumbaba as warder. I'm sorry, the god Elil has set the fearsome Khumbaba as warder. Column 5. To guard safely the cedars, to affright the peoples, Elil had appointed him, Khumbaba, his voice is like a trumpet, his mouth like the gods, his breath a wind. Even yet does Iabani strive to turn back his friend. They go on, approaching nearer to the mountain. Tablet 5. They stood still and looked at the forest, the height of the cedars they regarded. They contemplated the entrance to the forest, the high door, where Khumbaba enters. Well made are the roads, well made the path. They view the cedar mountain, home of the gods, sanctuary of Irnini. There follows some account of Humbaba's preparations for the fray, and the two dreams of Enkidu, the purport of which was to encourage Gilgamesh to expect success. The account of the contest is lost. But the issue is a great victory for the two friends, who return joyously to Uruk, probably bringing with them the long-lost statue of the goddess Irnini. Tablet 6. Gilgamesh washes his weapons, adorns himself in fine raiment, and sets a tiara upon his head. At the sight of him, thus glorious, Ishtar burns with love and addresses the hero. Come, Gilgamesh, be my lover, 
Give me the fruit, give me thy fruit, yea, give me. Be thou my husband, I thy wife. I will harness for thee a chariot of lapis lazuli and gold. That line is verbatim in the Penguins, Penguin Classics. Its wheels of gold, its horns of diamond, daily shalt thou span great horses to it. Enter into our house amid the scent of cedars. When thou enterest into our house, they shall, they, sh they that sit on thrones shall kiss thy feet. Before thee shall bow kings, lords, princes. The gifts of mountain and land shall they bring thee in tribute. But Gilgamesh curbs her, remembering her former lovers, and the sorry issue of their amours, for she was ever fickle. Which of thy lovers hast thou always loved? I think I can kind of skip this. This is basically just straight up what happens uh, in <clears throat> the Penguin classic. It's there on the screen. So, yeah, um, you know, it's totally just a statue, bro. To definitely just a statue said all this stuff to Gilgamesh. And Gilgamesh <clears throat> remembered all the former lovers of this statue, who is just a statue. And then this statue went up to one of the various heavens of the other gods, who I guess are statues too, and got the Bull of Heaven, which is uh, a statue that <laughs> can blow craters in the ground that 200 men can fall into, and fall to their death in. And yeah, so after all that, I mean just, I guess really boring, because <laughs> they're all statues. <laughs> after that, you know, drama unfolds. Uh, they held a high festival in the palace, but on that very night, Iabani, I don't know why they're calling Enkidu Iabani now, is visited again with an ominous and disturbing dream. Tablet 7. Enkidu tells his dream to Gilgamesh. So much seems certain to remain of this se of the seventh tablet, all else being uncertain. It seems probable, as Jensen suggests, that Gilgamesh should then interpret the dream. It seems also probable that a very fragmentary account of Enkidu's severe illness may belong to this tablet, though Jensen does not agree to this fucking Jensen. The matter must be left in uncertainty. No, there's nothing uncertain about it. Clearly the Bull of Heaven is some kind of uh, outer space combat vehicle, and you'll notice that it describes Enkidu as doubling over at one point when dealing, you know, when in combat with the Bull, and I think he was, you know, severely irradiated or something. All right, eighth tablet. Ankidu dies, though whether his death was due to disease or due to the smiting of the curses of Ishtar is unknown. No, it's obvious. I just said, as ancient astronaut theorists have confirmed, he died from <laughs> Gugulana-related radiation poisoning. Trust the experts. <clears throat> At first, Gilgamesh thinks his friend is merely asleep. Oh, God, I can't read this. <sighs> Enkidu, my young friend, thou tiger of the desert. Why do I have to read through this again? This is just... After everything possible, we, Lacuna, and the mountain have climbed, have taken and slain heaven's bull, have slain Humbaba, who dwelt in the cedar forest. Now, what is this sleep that has seized thee? Somber art thou, and thou hearkenest not to me. But he lifted not his eyes. He, Gilgamesh, touched his heart. It beat no more. Then he draped his friend like a bride, Lacuna, as a lion which cries Lacuna, as a lioness deprived of her whelps, Lacuna. He turned away, Lacuna. Then he flies away into the wilderness, crazed with grief. No judgments here, man. Gilgamesh wanders in the desert, apparently the vast wastes between Arabia and Syria. So say the Jensen... All right, Gilgamesh, for Enkidu, his friend, wept bitterly and wandered through the desert. Shall I not? Shall not I also die like Enkidu? Sorrow has come within my vitals. I fear death. Therefore, do I wander in the desert. In this mood, he feels how sad it is that no friendly herb grows with sovereign powers against death. So far as he knows, only one of his forefathers, Ut Napishtim, son of Ubara Tutu, has escaped death and is living far away beyond the western seas. To the power of Utnapishtim, son of Ubara Tutu, I take my way. I shall go quickly. To the deity, to the defiles of the mountain, I shall come by night. If I see lions in fear, I shall lift my head and invoke, invoke sin. He setteth out upon yonder long journey and arrives at Mount Mashu, perhaps in the Lebanon region, which he finds guarded by terrible scorpion men. Whose mien 
M-I-E-N. I've never seen that word before. And I kind of pride myself on having a big swing in vocabulary. Okay, whose mien is horrible and deadly. For some reason, they receive him kindly, though cautioning him of the dangers of his road. It's actually explicitly stated in the text why they receive him kindly, and it is because they can see he is one-third god. It is specifically because of his divine origin. There is probably something to do with restricted access for a certain kind of people. For twelve double hours he wanders in darkness and then sees the light of the sun once more. There, under the light, he finds himself in a beautiful garden by the seaside. Tablet 10. There on a throne sits Sidiri Sabitu, who, when she sees the unkempt Gilgamesh, is filled with terror and locks her doors. He threatens to break them down and is admitted, because that always works. Uh, to her questions, he tells her the story of Enkidu's death and all his troubles and sorrows since. From her, he begs tidings of the way to reach Ut-Napishtim, but receives a disappointing answer. Column 2. Sabitu said to him, to Gilgamesh, There hath never been a passage thither, and none from the days of old hath crossed that sea. Only the hero Shamath, Shamash hath crossed that sea, but except for him who shall pass it. The crossing is difficult, painful the way, and deep are the waters of death, which lie before it, hindering. Perhaps Urshanabi read also as Kalab Ia and Amel Ia, the sailor of Utnapishtim, who is just now nearby, may help him. When appealed to, he consents, and entering the ship, they cross in three days the sea which, under other circumstances, had cost a month and a half of journeying. This journey must have been the length of the Mediterranean, and the waters of death, which then lie before them, are doubtless the wild Atlantic itself. Then the journey becomes more dangerous, but at last they approach the coast where Utnapishtim stands, wondering to see a passenger brought to his realm. When greetings are over, Gilgamesh asks him how he had attained endless life, and in reply, receives the splendid story of the flood from the lips of the great hero who had survived its terrors. Gilgamesh said to him, to Utnapishtim the far away, I consider thee, O Utnapishtim, thy appearance is not changed, thou art like me, thou art not different, even as I am thou art. Thy heart is in perfect state to make combat, thou dost lie down upon thy side, and upon thy back. Tell me, how hast thou been exalted, and amid the assembly of the gods hast found life? Once again, that is almost verbatim what it says in the Penguin. Penguin, cl Penguin Classics version, only without the these and thous and begats and hasts. So, <clears throat> yeah... I don't think I'm going to read the rest of the Utnapishtim stuff because I've already done this text in two other videos and I think you already get the idea. It's on the screen now, along with some Babylonian flood texts. A digression, but also in the intro to the Penguin Classics, it was all, oh, there's a lively debate about if this is related to the biblical. Who can say if these disparate flood stories describe one event? It's like, shut up, nerd. It's virtually the exact same as the biblical story, with the one major difference being the Lord God character is split into the characters of Enlil and Ea with differing motivations. Other than that, it's almost ex exactly the same. It even ends with the angry Lord God taking them into the ship to make a covenant and give them, you know, self-government. I guess more like middle management, but, you know. So, yeah. I think I've made my point. And that point being that it really seems like people love to split hairs on this topic. Like, Oh, that's not really what the text means slash says. I call bullshit. Yeah, it is what the text means and says. This line is spuriously translated. Or, oh, these passages are out of order. As if my response is going to be like, Oh, my mistake. I see now. That makes it perfectly reasonable for virtually every culture to have folklore relating to a cargo cult relationship with what appear to be off-worlders and this to be explained away just as myth for ritual purposes. What a fool I've been. Sorry for wasting your time. Like, I mean, honestly, I I am a fool and I am wasting your time. I'm not sorry about it, though. Uh, I mean, it's just like, yeah, it's 
you're quibbling, or, you know, these people who, it seems like since they, <laughs> since they, you know, unless they're going the route of calling you crazy, since they can't challenge you on the fact that, you know, this is just all so strange, they don't really have another option but nitpicking, I suppose. Uh, and it seems like I was wrong on my impression that the Siduri episode was a later edition filler, and I'm glad to be wrong. Uh, instead, it ties directly into the Urshanabi bit, and I appreciate, though in hindsight I missed it, that the Penguin author included the inexplicable passage about Gilgamesh smashing the stone things or boat implements that require repairs before they can cross the salt sea at ludicrous speed. That sounds exactly like an example of the sort of telephone game of history trying to describe something insane, and I'm disappointed in myself, frankly, for missing it. But... I'm sure I'll live. Anyhow, I hope y'all are all having a great day. Um, go follow my Twitter, at SegaVax7. Handle is Future Ghost. I'm... I mean, if... Uh, if the controlled opposition, all the way Antichrist, new owner of the platform, you know, decides to make long-form video hosting and monetization a thing there. It seems like the place to be, though. You know. Anyways, yeah, remember to like, comment, subscribe, and most importantly, share a conservative UFO cultist perspective. Peace.